Tony, could you please uh, help us with roll? Sure. Jimenez? Here. Corrales? Here. Yep. Carrasco? Davis? Esparza? Here. Right. Okay. That was Esparza, right? Yes. Arenas? Here. Foley? Here. Camus? Here. Jones? Here. Ricardo? Present. You have a quorum. All right, thank you. Okay, um, we've now had staff presentation, so let's um, go to the members of the community. Uh, Mr. Soto. Soto? Um, Mr. Soto, it appears that you, you're, you're still muted. If you could unmute your, your device. We're still not able to hear you. Okay, Paul, we're gonna come back to you. It appears your device is still muted. So we'll come back to you and see, uh, hopefully if uh, you're able to figure that the device will we'll be able to call you right after this. Um, uh, Mr. Taylor. Hi, so I, I would just love to reiterate that as you think about redistricting, we have a chance to actually fix some of the wrongs with redlining and we should look at all of San Jose for where redlining has impacted communities. In the example of Willow Glen, we've recently heard that Willow Glen wants to be more inclusive. They would like to include more minorities. Well, Gardner is a 78% Hispanic neighborhood. And if Willow Glen really wants to be more inclusive, bring Gardner into D6. Thank you. All right, uh, Mr. Taylor, you want to try your device again? appears still to be muted. Um, so we'll come back to you. Uh, Carol Watts. Thank you, Mayor and City Council members. I'm Carol Watts, President of the League of Women Voters of San Jose, Santa Clara. We urge all of you to vote yes to place this measure on the ballot to expand the power of the IPA. It's important that its authority include an unredacted review of all complaints and investigations into every police use of force resulting in serious injury and unfettered access to police records. We understand and sympathize with the cost involved to add a measure to the ballot. Nevertheless, we hope that this issue can be a single measure. We're very pleased to see a proposal placed before the Rules Committee tomorrow on the subject of police reform including expansion of powers of the IPA through changes to ordinance. Thank you. The League of Women Voters supports a criminal justice system that is just, effective, equitable, and transparent. This will foster public trust and help eliminate systemic bias. Thank you for your time and dedication in serving our city. Thank you. Uh, Reverend Jones. Reverend Nancy Palmer Jones, forgive me. <laughs> well, thank you so much for giving my full name there. I yes. am the Reverend Nancy Palmer Jones. I am senior minister of the First Unitarian Church of San Jose and a member of PAC's beloved community team. Since 2015, we have brought together hundreds, perhaps thousands of community members to work with all of you, with Chief Eddie and the San Jose Police Department and the POA to increase police transparency and accountability. And we've had some successes but the events of this May and June show us that they are not nearly enough. We need a full restructuring of public safety in our city and a, and a radical change in the culture of policing. The beloved community team is working with other black, indigenous and people of color led organizations for these urgent and necessary goals. With your leadership, we can do this. And we know it won't happen overnight. The ballot measure to expand the IPA's role with the side letter that will allow future expansion is a partial but crucial step in the right direction. I believe it needs to stand on its own for clarity and the power of its 
of its purpose. Whatever it takes, my friends, let's get this done. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend. Uh, Mr. Beekman. Hi, thank you. With item 3.5, as you are trying to figure different combinations and ideas that can fit together as part of a fair elections initiatives for the fall ballot, a reminder, it has been years and a lot of public back and forth to get this IPA measure onto the fall ballot of 2020. I hope all sides can agree there can be a certain dignity of letting the IPA measure stand alone in this year's fall ballot. It is some of these ideas of better openness, trust, and cooperation with the future of police accountability and community. I hope these good efforts and democratic practices can continue with the thoughts and, our, and ideas of how a community-led police review board can work in conjunction with the IPA, SJPD, and SJ city government in the future. A community-led uh, oversight board that could possibly address oversight questions of technology, surveillance, data collection, and other like-minded subjects. Oakland and Berkeley have opened a door for Bay Area cities and what can be more open creative ideas to define the future of community services and policing. With help from county, state, and federal and international agencies, I hope local governments will not be afraid of their community and what could be the future of good democratic concepts for an individual community. Uh, I just wanted to quickly note that uh, with your previous item, you invited the police to talk about uh, gambling issues when you know social workers could possibly uh, be a much more uh, nuanced, better conversation for such a subject. Thank you. Thank you. Paul Soto? Yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Two items, they need to be separated, yet they have the, they, they're dealing with the same issue, which is institutionalized racism and systemic racism. The Planning Commission, I was disgusted by the fact that there was four people on that planning commission that were from Willow Glen, that we've all publicly acknowledged, you included, uh, Mayor Licardo, that that is the most redlined area in, in San Jose, which contributed to all of the associated injustices that come from racism. And one of them is the way that the police treat the public. Okay, so this is the, this is the system that I'm talking about. This is, why do we have to allow or even have the ballot to give the police auditor more power. Here's the reason why. Because the police department is not following the law. SB 1421 is a state law. That means that every single day that Chief Garcia does not produce that paperwork, that means it delegitimizes the power of the police department because they cannot follow the law and enforce the law at the same time. This is the kind of cognitive dissonance that goes on in the city, and that's why we have such disparate kinds of outcomes, is because that dissonance needs to come, become sound. There needs to be some kind of soundness and harmonious balance between the institutions that we use as a society to maintain order and the people in which that order is, 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 uh, is, is, uh, is assigned. You know, I'm really tired of it, man. I'm tired of educating white people that, hey, you know what? There's some systemic racism going on, and here's the ways that it is. No, but we're just following the law. No, when you use the law to break the law, you are no longer fit to enforce it. When you use the law to break the law, you are no longer fit to enforce it. And Eddie Garcia leaving at this particular time, that is a coward move. That is a coward move for him to leave at this time. Thank you. Thank you. I return into council. Uh, council Member Sparza. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, uh, I had a, a couple of questions. Uh, and so I just wanted to, because the presentation was super quick. So for those that are watching, um, so this uh, agreement, um, as the speaker just mentioned, brings us in line to state law, but also it allows the city and the POA to agree to further expansion of the IPA's duties subject to the meet and confer process without the need to return to voters for further charter modifications, correct? Correct. And then um, I have a question for the city manager, which is, um, so when this would come, 
back to council. So say, you know, this process is going to move forward, meet and confer, eventually it comes to us. What is the public, what do you see as the public's role at that point around IPA, the discussion around IPA powers? Thank you, council member. So I, you know, I think, I don't know if we've really thought that through. Certainly um, when uh, the council authorizes the administration to, to negotiate things with any of the labor groups, there's opportunities to, to engage um, you know, the public through the, the, the council process. Um, I don't know if Jennifer Shembri's on, I'm having trouble thinking of a scenario where we've actually done some sort of formal engagement process with the community as part of a negotiation with um, a labor group. And so uh, we'd have to think through that. that. That certainly would be a different scenario than our typical negotiation, certainly. And so would then there be space before that meeting confer process starts to get some input from the community? I think, because I think well, that, that those conversations are missing from the process. I mean, we're, we're discussing a, a ballot measure, but really, it's about IPA powers. And so I feel like the community's voice is the one element that's missing from this discussion. Yeah, fair enough. And obviously we're, we're talking about a, a very different type of um, process here. So certainly we could, um, we could figure out a way of engaging the community, getting input and having that factor into the council's a direction to, to staff to, to negotiate. Um, obviously, like I said, we're obviously dealing, dealing with a very different scenario than our normal negotiations with labor groups. I don't know, Jennifer, do you have any kind of thoughts on that? Um, so the only scenario I can think of that would be similar is on an annual basis, we bring forward the annual summary of labor negotiations um, before we start negotiations that allows, and we bring that to council in open session and that allows um, input for, from the public before we start negotiations. That would be something that we could similarly do. I suspect though, council member, you're, you're, I suspect you're, in, you're, you're talking about probably a more engaging process than, than a hearing. Um, well, you know, I think we've had protests, we've, and, and um, a lot of communication that is certainly ongoing. Uh, the community is still meeting. Um, you know, fortunately, we haven't had protests like we had the first few nights, but the community is still coming together. Um, they still want their voices heard. And I think we need to have a public dialogue in some respect um, around the issues. I'm hoping some of it can be. Um, incorporated in the police reforms and the other discussions that we're going to be having. But um, there have been a lot of discussions around the IPA powers from the community. And I, I do feel like that element is missing. And if we can find a way to engage the community beforehand and then incorporate it, that input in the process that Jennifer just described, then I think people would would see that they're incorporated in the decision-making process in a way that's respectful of all parties concerned, um, but that moves the city forward and respects um, respects the residents of the city, the employees of the city, um, in what what eventually um, we can come up with. And I appreciate that. Certainly, you know, we've got a pretty robust police report reform work plan that vast majority of it deserves community engagement involvement in that so you know we'll have to it's you know not necessarily needed to kind of detach the ipa duties from the other pieces of, of that puzzle so we'll need to figure out how, how we do that okay um thank you and then um i tony um you issued a supplemental um a revised supplemental memo. And so I wanted to ask uh, or give you a chance to talk about that because you reviewed the costs and put in um, quite an amount of work into that. Did you want to take a few minutes to explain what you came up with? Um, well, the main thing is I wanted to add a line to, I, I had neglected to add a line that said the additional ballot measures cost 629,000 base. 
Um, I also had revised the the amounts, just the, the math gets, I, I was an English major. I didn't go to law school to avoid math, but I was an English major to avoid it. Um, so I, I, it didn't change the totals too much, but the main thing was that the, the first ballot measure is about 1.7 million. A second one is 629,000. And we are budgeted for two ballot measures. Um, if we exceed that, we, what we'll do is come back in the mid-year to make budget adjustments. Okay, thank you. Um, and so, um, you know, I'm interested in seeing what my colleagues have to say, um, but I, I feel like, um, you know, certainly the planning commission and the redistricting go together and in the, um, and in the memo um, that we received with the language, um, there were the, the two paragraphs. Um, sorry. Um, my preference would be to include um, the three. I, I think, I feel like the community is smart. I think the community knows um, uh, equity when they see it in terms of the planning commission. I think the planning commission dovetails into the redistricting because it's going into the redistricting, redistricting process. Um, I think the community understands redistricting. And I think, frankly, the community understands IPA um, reform. What we're doing is aligning this into state law. Um, and so uh, my preference would be um, to have all three incorporated into one measure. Um, I won't make a motion because I do want to hear from my colleagues um, in terms of their preferences, whether we ultimately do two ballot measures between the um, card rooms, which we already voted on, which, um, and then whether we combine IPA, redistricting, and planning commission into one measure per the city attorney's language. Thank you. All right, I had myself on mute. Uh, thank you, council member. <clears throat> um, I want to just raise a few questions if I could um, add. First, Councilmember Sparza, I think, appropriately asked the question about the effect of um, the IPA measure. And I just want to be really explicit because we know uh, legislative intent is often referred to when there are disputes in language. And I think it's important to make a really clear record. So I want to be even more explicit. Uh, Assuming this measure passes, uh, regardless of whether it's combined or not, if the council negotiates with the POA and ultimately decides as after that full negotiation that it wants to expand the power of the IPA to handle negotiations. I'm sorry, to handle investigations, excuse me. The IPA's power would then include all investigations of police misconduct essentially shifting that from the police department into the IPA. I wanna be clear that the council could do that without going back to the ballot. So Mayor, if you look at the language on there, what, what I'd like to point out is that it says, um, perform such other duties consistent with this charter as may be required by him or her, by the council subject to any requirements to meet and confer. Um, with police officers. So what it says is it has to just be consistent with the charter. In some cases, you will see a chapter that says has to be consistent with this section or with this title. And so this isn't limited to the 809 section. It, the only limitation is the charter. And, and to give an example is you couldn't give the IPA authority to do uh, any Fine. work that was that the charter had given to another officer right. in the city right that would be inconsistent but so long as no other officer has the authority that you want to give the ipa the the, the council can give that authority um, through an ordinance so i appreciate that so clearly department of finance is described in the charter we can't give finance work to the ipa um, I haven't looked carefully at the charter recently to see whether or not there's any 
responsibility for investigations of misconduct that are explicitly given to the it, it, whether or not that responsibility is explicitly given. Right, and again, Mayor, we didn't um, we didn't look at that particular one, but there is an, an example uh, that I've we've talked it internally in our office is you couldn't give the IPA authority to discipline a police officer. Yes, um, because that is clearly under the authority of the city manager. So right. the question would be at the time that you're considering the new authority is, is there any other limitation in a ch charter with regard to that authority? Because it's already been granted to another officer to undertake that particular authority. Now, if it turns out that there is one where the authority has already been granted, you could go back to the, you could, that would have to go back to the, to the, to the voters because this is a limitation with regard to authority in the charter. Otherwise, you can give any other authority so long as you've done a meet and confer. Okay. Um, Ed, what I gave you wasn't just a hypothetical. It's actually something that several council members, including myself, have specifically proposed. So I'm not really asking this as an abstract question. It's really a concrete one. Um, so could I ask um, if anyone on your team has a moment? Mark uh, is, has looked at the issue. I don't know if he has to understand whether or not there's anything in the charter. I have not reviewed that specific issue in the last couple of days, so it's not fresh in my mind. But I think it's really important for us to know um, because this is a logical next step in terms of what we do around police accountability. And I know there are more than a few experts and advocates who believe that strongly this is important for the city to do. So Mark, have you looked at any other language that involves investigations? No, not, not with respect to this particular issue. I'm, I'm doing a quick search through the charter now uh, to see areas where the police department is mentioned. And, and so it would be something that would require a little bit more thorough review to, to get a definitive answer. Yeah, okay. Uh, Mayor, I, I don't know if, if maybe the city manager or Jennifer Shembri when they were having discussions with the POA, whether that issue came up, I'm, I'm assuming that if there was something they were trying not to include, it would have been discussed, but I, I don't know whether that came up in their discussion. No, it was Jennifer. Um, that issue did not come up. We've not looked at that issue. Yeah, I'm, I'm quickly looking through sec Article 8, because I know that's probably the most likely place for it to be, but I um, can't say it. It's clear in my mind. The reason why, obviously, I raised this now is because we have an opportunity to change the language uh, and specifically that limitation, because that limiting language is disconcerting to me uh, if it essentially ties the hands of the council to be able to expand IPA authority in a way that is logical. Um, <clears throat> so I know that folks are looking at it now. I'll give everyone a chance to, to do that and I'll do a little research on my own while we're all sitting here. Um, a second question I had is regarding to the language. Maybe this is a better question for Mark. I knew you were keeping all the drafting or Ed, whoever wants to respond. The word unredacted is in there, but it refers to the review, not to not to access to unredacted reports. It's actually unredacted review, I believe, with the language in the 75 words, is that right? That's correct, uh, with respect to the IPA measure. Can I ask, why is the word unredacted in there to modify review? And is there a reason why we can't simply delete it? Because I know what unredacted means because I used to have to redact documents and I'm a lawyer, but I don't know that a lot of voters are going to understand it clearly, and I'm not sure it's clearly applicable to the issue of review as it is to access to unredacted documents, which I think is a different issue. I think the point is fair. The, <clears throat> the reason why uh, unredacted review was included is because with respect to officer-involved shootings and use of force incidents, the IPA uh, would have the authority to review unredacted records. Right. Um, and whereas in other instances, unrelated to those, those two topics, 
there, there's a second component of it that would allow the IPA to review redacted records if certain criteria are met. So right. I think the unredacted, it was included there to, um, to make that distinction. But I, I think the point is well taken that, you know, there, if you could review records related to officer involved shootings and use of force, I, it, it, it doesn't seem, a, it's not a material issue that unredacted would be there. Okay. I would then ask that whoever makes the motion consider striking that word, because um, I think it will be confusing uh, to voters. I think ultimately- Can you repeat that? Uh, the, the suggestion would be for the maker of the motion to delete the word unredacted uh, that precedes review of officer involved shootings. Certainly the issue of redact redacting and unredacted reports will be in the text, obviously in the body of the, of the measure, uh, but I believe it may be confusing to voters if it's in the 75 words. Um, and then finally, as we look at these, um, <laughs> on the issue of the census and redistricting. Um, um, be, be, when we talk about the unredacted, Mark, that language is not that specific language that was required under the side letter, is it? No, the, this is with respect to the ballot question. Okay. Okay. And then um, with regard to redistricting in the census, um, I understand that the language says uh, when census results are late, that triggers our ability to be mm -hmm. with regard to the deadline uh, or a redistricting ordinance. Um, you know, having had several conversations with Terry Christensen about this, uh, his concern was expressed that in prior years in 2010 and in 2000, I'm not sure the census results were late or not, but the, the schedule is still so severely compressed that it didn't allow the redistricting commission to be work uh, as many had expected or preferred. And so the question is, um, is it critical? I'm trying to understand better. Um, it appears that it's late according to the ordinance, uh, uh, according to what's in the text that if results are not delivered to the state by April 1st, that makes census late. Is that right? That's correct. Okay, so I have not really been deeply engaged in this issue, but the question would be, is anybody got any institutional memory from 2010 or 2000 to tell us, even when they were delivered to the states on March 15th or some date earlier than April 1st, were we still badly squeezed on our timeline? So, uh uh, Mayor, I did look at the this issue in the sense that I reviewed the uh, advisory commission's reports from 2001 and 2011, and uh, I recall from both of those uh, time periods um, that the census was delivered early in March. the The issue that the advisory commission has is that their uh, report and recommendation is supposed to be due within 120 days of appointment. And they're under the charter supposed to be appointed by February 1st. And so their issue is, is that they're appointed um, and they would sit around for about a month and they really can't do anything until the census results are delivered. So there's about a, a month of, of inaction. And then when the census results are delivered to the states, even if they were done early in past years or earlier in past years, then they could get started on, on their work. That was the issue uh, that both advisory commissions recommended changing and the proposed measure would do that because it would allow the council to establish a deadline itself for the advisory commission. Uh, so presumably, or if it were to pass, uh, when the council were to appoint the advisory commission on February 1st, it can assess the lay of the land and say, we would like you to have the report to us by you know, 90 days after uh, April 1st, so any deadline that the council uh, sees fit. Uh, the only issue is if the council, for whatever reason, didn't establish a deadline for the advisory commission, then it would be a, the default would apply, and they would have to have their report and recommendations due within 120 days following appointment. Okay, I think I caught most of that, Mark. And I know this is 
it's not easy to describe. So I think you did a very good job of it. I, I guess the question, I, I, maybe if I can rephrase the question a little bit, do we really want to qualify it by saying that the council can establish timelines only when the census results are late, or do we just want to give the council some more flexibility here so we can get the job done properly? You, that's something that can be done. Um, the one consideration, uh, there's a few consideration considerations, is that um, there's a, a state law that was enacted last year um, governing redistricting for uh, cities cities who are just going down the route, having district elections and so on, that establishes a deadline, I believe of August 15th, which is consistent with what the state law does. It only, it doesn't necessarily apply to charter cities if we establish our own deadlines, which we have here. Um, so if the council were to um, do away with the October 31st deadline, we would have to come back with an implementing ordinance to make sure that we had a deadline in place um, in order to comply with state law. So that's one consideration. In addition, um, and, and this comes into play with uh, the changes in the, uh, with the elections being held in March as opposed to June, and again, comes down to, I guess, council preference at the time, is the redistricting ordinance has to be in effect by the opening of the nomination period for the new districts to apply. And so um, October 31st, um, is a is a good deadline in that um, if the for the March 2022 election, I believe the nomination period begins uh, and don't call me some middle of November. I want to say November 14th. So again, if if the redistricting ordinance isn't enacted in that time, uh, and maybe the council establishes a different deadline by ordinance, uh, then the new districts don't go into effect, and the old districts will will stay in for that uh, election. So I, I think what you're saying is um, there's no point in having unlimited flexibility here. Well, it it it, it depends on what the council's uh, objectives are with respect to redistricting. At some point in 1994, I believe it was when this charter amendment was put in place. The decision was made: we want to have the redistricting ordinance in effect October 31st. Yeah. Uh, the state of California, by constitution. Uh, theirs is uh, August 15th. Uh, so it's it's consistent with other uh, redistricting schemes that uh, that there is a set deadline, but uh, the council by ordinance, uh, if the charter could be amended to say that whatever deadline the council implements by ordinance, um, and that would allow additional flexibility. Uh, so it, it depends on the preference of the council or the decision of the council at the time. and. Uh, and any concerns that they have that uh, future councils may not uh, redistrict in a timely fashion for whatever reason. Um, so unlimited flexibility could be difficult if there can't be a consensus uh, later on down the road. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll move over those issues as we continue the dialogue. Uh, Vice Mayor Jones. Thank you, Mayor. And I actually had the exact same question you did in terms of the language being consistent with the with this charter. And I just want to make sure that I understood um, Mark and Ed what you're saying. And that is, if if there's a, a duty or responsibility or an authority that's in the charter that's in conflict with something that we might propose through the meet and confer process. That's in conflict, then the the charter, whatever's in the charter, would supersede anything we try to would try to come up with in terms of that meet and confer process. Is that inaccurate? That's, cor that's correct. If there's a conflict with another provision of the charter, you can't give that additional duty. So if because be because normally when you have that, um, when you have a possible conflict, you give the authority to both officers just like you were planning to do with the strong mayor one where you were giving the mayor and the city manager the same authority the charter has to has to be consistent so um so that's why the language in there just basically says you can give any other duties that's not set forth in this particular charter in this particular section so long as it's not in, uh, it's consistent with the rest of the charter so by default uh even stating um, consistent with this charter, it can be necessary or, or not necessary because by, by default, 
um, right. it would it would take effect anyway. And yeah, that's why I said it, it, the, the language in there is simply, it, it's trying to just to be consistent to make sure that there, everyone understands is you can give any duty you want so long as it's consistent with the charter. That's the overall. And as I mentioned before is sometimes the language will say consistent with its chapter, which means it's just within the context of this 809, but that's not the case in the way it's written. It's, you have to look at the whole charter. And so long as there's no inconsistency with the rest of the charter, which is what it normally would be, you can give whatever other duty you want to the IPA. Okay. So as long as we don't have that conflict and we uh, reach an agreement um, through the meet and confer process, that's, that's something additional authorities or responsibilities that we can we can move forward Correct. and put into the mini code as Correct. a mini code change. Correct. Okay. I just wanted to just make sure that we were all clear on that. And then um, as far as um, consolidating the ballot measures, uh, initially I, I, I was leaning towards um, having the IPA item as a standalone item, but obviously we want to weigh couple of different factors. One is the additional cost. Two is any potential confusion with the voters in terms of having three uh, charter changes um, in the same 75 words. And then I guess another fact would be the potential where one of the charter changes <clears throat> might potentially uh, weigh down the other ones in terms of if there's the opposition or if the voters aren't uh, supportive of one particular element. I really don't see um, that third scenario being a factor here. And as far as um, potential confusion with the voters, um, because I'm so intimately familiar with um, all the items in the language, uh, it's hard for me to really gauge whether combining them or consolidating them would be confusing or uh, cause any issues. But uh, just from my reading, of the, of the consolidated language. Um, I don't see that being a, a significant issue. So I'm leaning towards um, saving the money, consolidating them into one ballot, one ballot measure and, uh, and doing it that way. So that's my input. Thank you. Is that a motion? Is, is, that, is that a motion uh, you were asked by Council Member Menes? It wasn't, but I can make a motion. Second. So moved with um, with the mayor's um, one uh, revision of striking the unredacted uh, review of officers involved shooting from the, the language. Uh, uh, just the word unredacted. Un unredacted, yes. Yes, just the word unredacted. Yeah. Okay. And that that and is that uh, acceptable to the seconder? It is. Okay. Great. Um, and, I'm just uh, popping it on the screen to make sure we've got it correct. Yeah, I believe so. Um, is that right, Vice Mayor Jones? I'm yes. sorry, I can't read that. Is that the combined one or is that the, that's the combined one? Yes, okay. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you. And Thank Vice Mayor, I, I agree. I don't think these are items that are likely any of these are likely to have any significant opposition. Uh, certainly no funded opposition, I would expect. So I agree that probably makes sense and they're relatively straightforward. Um, I, I just wanted to follow up on one thing that was said I, I, at, about the words consistent with the charter. In some ways, aren't, aren't those words consistent? Uh, duplicative and uh, unnecessary. If, if I were to, if the council were to approve an ordinance that conflicted with the charter, that ordinance could never, I mean, if it was challenged, then someone could easily strike the ordinance, right? Correct. Um, before, uh, with, with regard to the question you're moving, uh, Mark, was this language that was in the side letter? Is it, is it consistent with the charter? Uh, I believe so. So yes. that language was included in the side letter that OER and POA agreed would be in the charter language? So uh, 
So Mark, I just want to give you a chance to respond to that last uh, qualification of that question, which was, that was part of the side letter that actually defined the charter language. Those words were- the, the term inconsistent with the charter, the, the language that you're referring to perform other duties was uh, in the side letter agreement that the council approved. Right, but I guess the question is, was it in the portion of the side letter that defined the language of the charter change? Uh, yes, it did. I, okay. I, if I'm following your question, okay. if the side letter agreement was the basis for the charter amendment. So if we agreed that the words were superfluous for the purpose of a legal analysis, would we have to put them in the charter language because they're part of that side letter agreement? If, 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 um, if there's no, well, anything in the charter has to be consistent with itself. So anybody can bring up an act, bring an action and say, you can't adopt that ballot measure because it's inconsistent with the other section. So right. yes, it may be superfluous. Yes, because they would apply regardless of whether the language is there. We put it in there because it was part of the side letter agreement and because we were told that that was the language that was expected to be on the charter measure. So would we be violating the side letter agreement if we didn't include it? You, you need to ask um, uh, the city manager's office as to whether or not they would feel that it would be one because my understanding is there was a signed agreement that said this is what the language will include. Yeah. Jennifer, did you mind why? Yeah, um, I don't know. Kind of have to think about that. Uh, the side letter agreement wasn't the actual charter language. That was we came up with that afterwards, um, but that was run by the POA, not in an agreement format. But we we shared it with them, and they thought it was consistent with our side letter. So our side letter is definitely not the actual charter language, um, but it could cause a dispute is, that we would want to um, try to avoid if if we were to take that out. So. And I don't know, Dave, if you want to add anything. Yeah, I, well, I, I mean, I've only had one conversation with the POA. You know, my instincts tell me they, well, I, don't, I want to be careful. My instincts tell me they would not be hung up on this, you know, but. Um, okay, I know, I know your, your head stink is nobody wants to speak for another agency. I, yeah, right. organization, and I, I appreciate that, Dave. I know you're, uh, you're in a tough position trying to do that. Um, and let me then just go back and, and reframe my question a little bit. 809A of the charter defines the authority of the IPA. And the authority of the IPA is defined under 809A to include review of investigations. Correct. Now, under the current language of the charter, we know that's a limit, right? Correct. And what we'd like to believe we're doing with this charter revision is we're lifting the lid, not limit. So other authorities, other responsibilities as assigned by council can be hoisted on the IPA. And I just want to understand if what council approves a year from now is IPA thou shalt conduct investigations of officer misconduct. Is that going to be deemed inconsistent with section 809A? Right now it says review you could later on after meet and confer say review and initiate review and investigate um, whether or not you would take away be able to take away the full investigatory power of the police department and give it all to the ipa would be a question you would have to look at to make sure that it wasn't inconsistent with the rest of the charter okay let's ignore the rest of the charter for a moment let's okay. just on 809A, I just want to understand with regard to the charter's vesting authority in the IPA. Correct. Is there going, because this is important we establish a clear legislative record on this, about what the council intends to do. I would prefer a world in which 809A did not constrain us from being able to assign additional responsibilities by ordinance. Um, but it's important to know how we, meaning the attorney's office in the city, read 809A, and can we put investigatory authority in the IPA, investigatory authority over police misconduct cases, without 
running afoul of 8098A. Right. 8098A spe specifies what her authority is, but you have a provision F, which allows you to give her additional authority. So yeah. with regard to the first one, it says review. You could add review and initiate. You could add review and investigate. You could add review and something else. Right. Uh, so that so long as you did the meet and confer. Right. Okay. So I think the answer is if 809A were the only thing we were worried about in the charter, we'd have clear sailing to be able to add investigations. Correct. Okay. Then the question is, is there something else lurking in the charter that could constrain us in some way? And I'm guessing several of us have been looking through the charter trying to find that. Right. Um, and I think Mark also tried doing a, a, a word search and stuff and wasn't able to find it, but I can't tell you today that there is nothing in there. Right. But our assumption is that there isn't anything with regard to police oversight. Most of that is basically just under the general authority of the city manager and the police department. It's not specified in the charter, but again, I, we have not done a specific check for that other than what we've done this afternoon. Understood. Okay. That's what I assumed as well. But Mark, you're searching for the word police or... <laughs> I am, and it's uh, at this point, it's uh, you know, trying to find a negative. I'm not, I'm not finding anything. Okay, that's. I, I know that's hard. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you're doing the word search for police. Hopefully, that will find anything refer, referring to police. Uh, okay, we'll we'll move on. Uh, Vice Mayor Jones, you have your hand up. Did you want to? I want to come back to you. Uh, you're you're on mute. Well, I just didn't take. I just didn't take my hand. Yet. Okay. Okay. Great. Councilor Jimenez. Yeah, I think a lot of the sausage making has already been made. Uh, so I just have uh, maybe one or two questions. Uh, but let me just first say that I, I like Council Member Jones, or Vice Mayor Jones, don't see any one of these, whether it's the Planning Commission, redistricting, uh, or even the IPA is going to be a drag on either of those. I don't see anything that there. And so that's why I'm comfortable with going with the consolidated version. I think uh, in an effort to save money, I think they all naturally fall under uh, a charter amendments. And, and I think the community as stated by uh, council member Esparza is smart enough to sort of parse that out and understand what we're putting forward. Um, and so that, that's why I supported it. Uh, I did have one question for staff. H has there ever been a um, past ballot measure in which we consolidated sort of three of these items together? And I apologize, probably should have asked the question before the meeting. I just didn't get a chance to, but uh, is there, I, I just wonder what, if there's a precedent for this and, and if there's anything we just need to be aware of as, as we're moving forward with, with, with regard to these three items, although they fall under the same umbrella in my mind, you know, just curious. I don't recall, Mark, do you recall looking at any past measure that had more than one item? Uh, well, not that I can recall. I mean, with, with charter uh, changes, um, it is appropriate for the council to uh, do um, many different things to take advantage of efficiencies and a single measure and whatnot. Um, there's nothing on the top of my off the top of my head that um, had different topics like this uh, in a ballot measure. Okay. All right. Uh, and just to put it out there, I mean that that worries me a little bit. But again, I think that uh, that the that the community is going to be wise enough to sort of parse out exactly what these mean and and the importance of them. Um, the other thing I would just say to to I'm not sure how many um, community members are on the line. It seems like we have about 19 attendees. But uh, I think this is I don't expect any opposition to any of these. Uh, you know, uh, being put out in the community or, or folks sort of funding opposition, but. I think it's important to say for everyone that's listening is that uh, if you care about any of these items, I think it's going to be important to spread the word and, and to engage your your neighbors and to tell them about the importance of getting this passed. Uh, so uh, I think these are all important. Very excited to get them before the voters, and I expect that come uh, come November, I think they're going to be approved. So thank you so much. Thank you, Councilmember. Um, hey, uh, do you mind if I take one more pass? Uh, there may be other passes to the comments we go on in this dialogue, but no one else has got their hand up, so I'm going to ask it. Uh, Section 411, as you know, um, deals with non-interference in administrative authority of the city manager and that the council cannot interfere with that. Um, is there anything about our passing 
a, an ordinance that would give investigatory authority over police misconduct cases, the IPA that could run afoul of 411 in your view? Well, you'd have to look at the you'd have to look at the language of the charter, and if there is no specific language that delegates to the city manager investigatory authority, I mean, I suspect that there could be an argument that it's implied in his authority. Um, but I think we're looking more, and the example that I gave you was more of the specific example that I said is the IPA could not, as a result of an investigation, try to discipline it or, because that discipline is clearly set forth in the charter for the city manager, but the investigatory power, my assumption is based on a practice policy um, and probably um, some agreements with the, PO, with the POA uh, and not specifically in the charter. Okay, thank you, Ed. Um, are there other questions or comments? Mark, I'm looking right now at 701 as well, see if there's anything in there. Part of the power of the city manager. Take a look at that as well. Mayor, can I ask a question while you're looking? Yeah, Council Member Menace. Yeah, so, so Tony, so the two point, I think it was 2.7 million allocated for two ballot measures. So this would obviously keep us out about that, right, or, or under that, so we wouldn't need to come back uh, at a later date to, to, to fund an additional measure, right? Ballot. Yeah, it would keep us about that. Um, usually the bill does come in a little higher, but um, it shouldn't be significantly higher. Okay, all right, cool. Thank you. So could I make a suggestion? I, I know that Mark is doing his best word searching and um, everyone needs a little time. I happen to think this is a pretty central issue to us, um, at least those of us who are interested in moving forward other expanded responsibilities. I wanted to ask if we could move on to other items. This this motion's been made. We'll come back to the motion and vote on it, um, but give the city attorney's office some time just to check the charter and make sure uh, we feel relatively confident there's no tripwire out there. Would that be uh, acceptable? Any concerns with that? You want to make a, you want to make a motion to table the, mo the, the motion for, until later in the meeting? I'll ask the vice mayor if you'd be willing to take concern with that. Yes, yeah, so I'm fine with that. Do I need to make a formal motion or just? Well, I think the, 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 you have to get the sense of the council that they're in agreement that they don't want to take a vote now, but take it later. So the motion I'm okay with it. Uh, I guess I'll make a motion to, to uh, table this uh, item to later in the meeting. So okay. Second. All right, great. Uh, there's a motion and a second. <clears throat> uh, Let's do this by verbal vote and we'll see if there are any objections. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone object to that motion? Okay, I'm hearing no objection. So we're gonna move on and come back to that motion. Uh, so we'll go on to item 3.6, which are actions related to declaration suspending the enforcement of certain provisions and land use permits and approvals and zoning encroachment requirements in the Unicode, also known as Alfresco. Welcome, Blage. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, there is not a, uh, a staff presentation, um, but I do have just a couple comments to just clarify uh, what is before the council this evening. So good evening, Mayor and council members. Uh, Blage Zalalich with the Office of Economic Development. Uh, the item before you tonight asks the council to do two things. Uh, one is to confirm and ratify the emergency declaration that was signed by the city manager on July 21st around the allowance of street business areas. And then also um, to amend the emergency declaration that was issued on June 4th around the expansion of business operations on public sidewalks. So by approving what you have uh, before you tonight, you will basically streamline the application process, waive fees and allow the city to close streets, uh, allowing for the expansion of business operations in approved locations, facilitating the compliance with the county's health order and social distancing protocols. And you'll also enable businesses that are already allowed to use the sidewalk to basically expand their outdoor dining and seating operations under San Jose Alfresco 
into areas in front of their neighboring businesses with the consent of their neighboring business owner or property owner. Um, these, this relaxation of rules in both cases would be in effect through December 31st, um, unless our local emergency ends before that date, which I think we're all probably very hopeful of, um, but, but probably not going to happen, um, or the time at which the city reinstates uh, the existing regulations. And so uh, that's it in a nutshell. With that, I'm just happy to take any questions that uh, the council might have on these two recommendations. Thanks. Move to approve. Second. second. Uh, thank you. Uh, motion and second. Let's go to the community and thanks, Bage, for your work. Uh, oh, somehow I lost. Okay. Uh, Paul Soda. Uh, thank you, Council. Um, back in the 1970s, I had to deal with on these sidewalks, this city making money off the porn industry. Okay, I lived in the Horseshoe, so I had to walk to the Jose Theater. And now to walk to the Jose Theater, I had to walk through five porn shops, three porn theaters, and a bunch of hookers on, San, on Williams and 2nd Street. Now, I dealt with that. I'm a big boy. I'm from the Horseshoe. We dealt with that. Okay, and now, now that all of this money and all of this stuff is coming to this city and all these resources, now I got to feel like a stranger on my own sidewalks because of this encroachment. And encroachment is a, is a, that is an accurate word because it is encroaching. It's encroaching on my ability to enjoy a sidewalk because some rich people with money want to make more money. And that's offensive to me. And it shouldn't be offensive to anybody on this council with any sense of place, any sense of, because that tax money that completed the infrastructure on those sidewalks was from Mexican labor. Because this was, all, this was also an agrarian economy. You don't believe me? Follow the railroad tracks. Walk the railroad tracks in San Jose and it will lead you to every single, every single cannery in this city. So this city was built on that and I had to deal with that. And now I gotta, I gotta feel that tension because there is tension when you're walking on the sidewalk and they have the, uh, the sitting dining area on one side and you're walking through, you, you could just feel it like somehow or another, I'm some kind of stranger. I'm never gonna eat at this restaurant. You know why? What it costs to sit and eat in one of those restaurants for one meal for two people is, a, is at least 10 days worth of groceries for me, 10 days. And so this is, this is very offensive to me that this person who represents that office didn't have a report for me, didn't have slide, didn't have some kind of explanation for me. Let's just streamline the process so we can make rich people richer. Thank That's you. offensive to me. Thank you. Scott Largen. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, Scott Largen. You know, this, I believe it's called Alfresco. I, I gotta get the word down there properly. Um, you know, this outside dining uh, gig that we have going on downtown, a lot of the uh, business owners that I interact with down there, um, most of them are very frustrated with the mentally ill and homeless that are that are showing up at a lot of these locations. Um, now, I don't blame them. They're thirsty. They need water. You guys shut off the water everywhere. Um, so they're going to go to the closest place where they see somebody drinking water or they can ask for a water. Um, Starbucks is very nice about things. They give water, they give out sandwiches. They, uh, you know, they're like peace offerings to get somebody to go along their way. Um, I, I, I think we really need to look into what's going on downtown right now um, with the mentally ill and homeless. Uh, they are being dumped in our city. Um, Salinas Police Department shows up at 2.30 in the morning and they drop uh, inmates off and uh, uh, criminals at, at the corner of the park right there. Um, Larger, and, if you wish to speak on this item, three points. Uh, this is about the outside dining, so you can let me finish my. I, I'm on. I'm on point, bud. Yeah, if you could get to the point, we appreciate it. Well, maybe you should stop interrupting people and allow them to have their public comment. Larger, you have 42 seconds left. Hey, you know what, Sam? Why don't you resign also too, like Garcia? You're another problem to our community right here. Thank you, Mr. Larger. Uh, JT. I'm just encouraged uh, by what you guys are doing. So I'd like to say good job. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tessa Woodman, see? Uh, 
Ms. Woodman, see you have, uh, it looks like your device was muted. Okay, spoiler. Okay, all right, we'll return to council now. Uh, <clears throat> council member, Ms. Parson. Thank you. Um, I just have a few questions, which is um, what are the outreach or what is the outreach strategy to reach out to businesses that are not in the designated shopping centers? Um, sure. Thanks for that question, council member. Um, so we have had uh, a few mechanisms by which we're doing outreach. Um, initially, when we were all under kind of the EOC um, structure, uh, what we did was primarily communicate uh, through the liaison branch to uh, the council members and the council offices with a couple of toolkits that were sent out um, because we felt like the, the most direct contact with many of the businesses was through the council member uh, communication. Um, in addition, uh, we did post, there's a page on San Jose uh, CA.gov backslash uh, SJL Fresco uh, that is translated in multiple languages and has all of the information about the program and the different uh, kind of streamlined processes uh, with respect to sidewalks and private property, uh, parklets, uh, and now uh, if this is ratified, uh, street closures uh, on the website. Um, in addition, uh, in those areas where there are neighborhood business districts and neighborhood associations, uh, we've utilized the mostly volunteer staff uh, from those organizations to get the word out to their members about the different Alfresco initiatives. Um, and then we've also, uh, to the extent that we were doing business outreach and kind of touching base uh, through our business assistance and business outreach um, team, business development team, also letting people know um, about the different kind of streamlined processes. Um, now, uh, the, the great thing is that you all also uh, approved uh, with the June budget, uh, the PRNS placemaking team, which has some resources um, and has been talking uh, to uh, the different council offices about uh, areas of focus that they would like to have for support in their, in their districts. And so we're looking forward to the placemaking team also being able to um, support some of these alfresco kind of business initiatives. So those are the things that we've been doing. Um, our intention is to continue uh, to do that outreach and actually uh, to the extent that we can do more outreach. And Kim earlier uh, in the conversation talked about the brochure uh, that they're putting together. I anticipate that there will be information in that brochure about how people can get um, uh, information on Alfresco, uh, the different permits that they can, they can obtain uh, free of charge and, and very easily. But we're also very open to other ideas that you have um, on outreach if you feel like there's certain areas that um, have been lacking. Yeah, I mean, I, I, um, I know my office has been talking with economic development and we've been having conversations about the shopping centers. Um, I, I, I like, I'm sure all of my colleagues have been approached by businesses in different industries, so they're not all restaurants, but mm -hmm. um, you know, some of these strip malls are dead right now um, and uh, so I'm, I'm interested in, I, I think there's a lot of opportunity, particularly in what we're doing today, but also what we're gonna be doing in the coming weeks about offering some flexibility and uh, utilizing space better to bring bodies in and make it lively. I don't think any of us wants mm -hmm. empty storefronts um, for months or a year, you know years on end. Um, so, um, yeah, I look forward to having those conversations. I, I, I'm just looking at some of the um, business areas in my district. They don't all have vibrant neighborhood associations. And even a lot of the small businesses and mom and pops and the micro businesses um, that have a lot of interrelated relationships um, where a storefront will have relationships with micro businesses um, in the area. Um, you know, they don't, it, it's hard for them to communicate with city hall, right? And so, um, being more creative on the outreach, um, I think is important in making sure that this really great idea is accessible throughout the city. So I look forward to doing that. Um, also, can we streamline the application for the Alfresco public sidewalk seating registration to match the Alfresco private property business operations registration? 
So they're, they're pretty similar. Um, I'm assuming when you're talking about private property operations, um, the, so they're pretty similar, quite honestly. So it, um, it, 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 it redirects people to the general permit page um, without showing them what permit to use. So the Alfresco Private Property Business Operations Registration, God, that's a really long name. It directs people to the right online application, right? So if, if you're a mom and pop and you're trying to, okay, where do I go? What do I do? You get redirected to the general per, uh, permits page. Yeah, I think I know what you mean. I, I think um, because the Public Works has the purview of the sidewalk, Public Works has a variety of other permits that they provide. And so um, let us go back and work on just adjusting the link on their end so that it goes right to that, that application. For the private property, um, that's something that sits kind of in its separate place. So I, I hear you, and I think that that is a relatively easy fix. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and it, is there an issue with allowing businesses to utilize sidewalks for retail purposes? Um, so I wouldn't say that there is an issue. That's actually one of the items that's on our next work plan and we'll be coming back. Um, in the memo we mentioned uh, that there were kind of three other items that we've been getting requests for. And one of them is the expansion of retail operations onto sidewalks. And so that is something that um, we are kind of working through right now and uh, plan to come back uh, to council by the end of the month, um, amending that sidewalk ordinance. Great. I, I think having some flexibility, I, I don't think, um, you know, it makes sense for every shopping center or strip mall in the city, but um, giving uh, businesses in the city to have some flexibility, again, because I don't want dead space. I'm sure a lot of the business owners um, don't want that either. And so I think there's an opportunity with this. Uh, I'm thinking like Tropicana, for example, or um, some, you know, La Placita, right? Some places that we can make it, um, make it easier to do some retail operations outdoors. Um, it might work in some places. Um, it might not work in others. So I just wanted to bring that up. Yeah, absolutely. And I would, I would just um, want to clarify that right now, if they have a privately accessible sidewalk, right? So if that sidewalk that they have in front of their business is on private property and or if they have the parking lot accessible, that you're already allowed to expand your retail operations onto that private property, whether it be a sidewalk or a parking lot. So what we're working on um, that we're gonna bring back is specifically for the public sidewalk and the public right of way. So just to clarify, um, just to make sure that if you have somebody that wants to do retail on private property, they can totally do it. Okay, cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I know that um, you're wrestling with a lot, given there's a lot of different sites throughout the city where people might intend to want to do their business outside, do you know, have commerce outside. Um, is there anyone else on the team other than you who's working on this? Is this all you? No, it's not all me. It could never, it couldn't be all me. We were doing a ton of work. There's actually um, a, a host of folks from kind of nine different city departments. Okay. Um, all working very diligently on this and have been working very diligently on this. Everybody from CAO, uh, Parks and Rec, IT, right. uh, OCA, Public Works for sure. Um, okay. Got it. So there's I'm lots sure I'm leaving somebody out, but there's about nine departments uh, worth of people that are involved in all of these Afresco measures. Okay, great. Um, so how many businesses do you think are registered so far? So right now we have about 60 that are registered for private property um, and about 20 ish or so a little bit over 20 um, that are have permits for kind of sidewalks parklets or um, uh, the, the street closure. I mean, there's only one street closure currently uh, on San Pedro. Um, I do anticipate that there are a number of folks that are um, operating that are that are not registered necessarily, um, probably because they don't know that they have to. And so, you know, to the extent that we can all help to get the word out, it, I think if the more people we can get registered, the more people we know this program serves, then it's easier it's going to be uh, for you all to make decisions moving forward um, about, you know, continuing the program or making adjustments or, or whatnot. 
Agreed. And they can just do that online easily, right? Registering? Yes. Okay. So yes. why do you think there aren't more businesses that are registering, particularly restaurants? Um, I think it's probably a combination of people not knowing that they, you know, can or should. It's pretty easy to be registered. Um, it's probably also a combination of people just doing what they need to do to help their business survive. And so they're just, they're plugging along. Um, and, and so I think the more we can get the word out, um, the, the better off everybody will be. Yeah, I agreed. Um, and, and I guess we're hearing anecdotes and I only have anecdotes. I don't have any hard data just that some folks aren't even aware that they can go outside. And that's what gets me worried because we know this is really a, a matter of uh, survival for many of these small businesses. Um, I understand there was a lot, there, there seems to be uh, some concern about sidewalks, public sidewalks and trying to figure out the right rule. Can you help me understand why we wouldn't just come up with something fairly simple like, hey, if Department of Transportation says you need X feet of sidewalk for people to be able to safely walk down the street and be able to have the ADA accessible and so forth. I don't know what the number is. Let's say it's eight feet. I don't know. Then you can have all the room up to that eight feet. Is there a reason why we wouldn't just come up with a straightforward rule like that it says, as long as you allow X feet of, of clearance, do whatever you want on the sidewalk? So initially when we did, so the streamlined rules are, are kind of like that. Um, they're, they're definitely pared down um, from what pu public works is normally required because the review time is virtually non-existent. You submit your registration and you basically have the okay um, to, op to operate um, on the sidewalk. So initially when we started this, there were a number of uses that were not allowed yet by the county order. And so what happened, if you'll remember, like on a Tuesday morning or Tuesday afternoon, the county said on Friday, you can do um, outdoor dining. Um, and so we really hustled basically from Tuesday afternoon <laughs> to Friday to get all of this up and running so that people could be on the sidewalk at no charge, putting out seating for outdoor dining. Um, at that point, you could do um, indoor shopping at a lesser capacity. And so we also included outdoor seating, even if you weren't a public eating establishment so that you could in essence have a waiting area outside if you needed it. Um, at that point, uh, we weren't contemplating, we, we just needed to get that done. We felt like those were the two things, uh, that plus the private property, there's no restriction or there are very, very few restrictions on the private property. Private property, you can do retail, um, you can do um, food, you can do um, you know other, other services that are allowed by the county order. So we figured that that was going to help the most number of businesses citywide. So now we're circling back. We've done three other orders. Um, now we're circling back and what we've heard is the folks doing retail need additional space. And we've also heard that personal care and personal services, which are now allowed to operate outdoors only um, would like the space as well. So we'll take a look at what we might be leaving out um, we can certainly take a look at what we might be leaving out. And if for some reason we're leaving something out that we think um, people will, will want to operate on the sidewalk and there's not a huge issue, certainly we can include that. Okay. So that we don't have to come keep coming back. <laughs> yeah, no, I appreciate that. I, you know, I know that your goal is to make it simple for folks so they don't have to be, you know, they don't have to go hire a lobbyist to figure out how it works. Uh, I just know that, you know, from what I've heard, there is a, 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 some significant interest in being out on the public sidewalk and to the extent we can make a simple rule, that would be great. Hey, um, Mayor, do you, do you have a specific example of a use other than maybe retail or personal services or what's allowed now where somebody has said they haven't been able to do it? Oh, I was under the impression we had some greater constraint over public sidewalks. Am I, am I? Yeah, uh, I don't, well, other than kind of retail, um, which is a big one, obviously retail is a big one. So I think that if we get retail and we get personal care services, we, we probably have covered. Yeah, I agree. The vast majority. No, those were the people's requests. Okay, great. And then finally, what do you, what do you think is preventing us from seeing more street closures? 
at this point? What's what's sort of the big obstacle or the big challenge? Um, I mean, I think you know we we let me qualify that not just street okay. closures but just lane closures. I know in many cases you can't close all street, but maybe you just close a lane so you can still allow, allow some traffic, but be able to have seating out in the street and that kind of thing. Yeah, so I mean, there are a variety of items to take into consideration when you're doing a lane closure or a street closure. We do have some criteria, um, let's say specifically for a street closure, um, that you know predominantly the, ma the majority of the businesses in the surrounding neighborhood want it and will utilize it. Um, that there are there are not dedicated bike lanes and or bus routes on that street because there's a significant lift in. Not to say that it's not possible, but it's not as easy and it will take more involvement with VTA and other folks in trying to get the street closed. Um, also that the, um, the ingress and egress, we have kind of conversations with PD and fire about street closures. And so every one of those potential street closures is kind of an, um, an episode that you have to look at in and of itself. So we tried to give five general criteria that are, are named in the memo for the streets that we look at. Um, and then if people are coming to us and they say, okay, we'd like this street to be closed, then we'll go more in depth assessing how that might be able to be done. If not a street closure, then maybe a lane closure. If not a lane closure, then for instance, parklets. Okay. So. Yeah, I, again, I'm only hearing anecdotes, but I'm hearing like on South First Street, it's becoming well, this business wants this thing, this business wants another thing. And I know we don't have the bandwidth to play mediator in the United Nations among what 10 different businesses run, right? And, and so I'm just wondering, is it possible for us to take an approach that says, look, we're just gonna close a lane. <laughs> we won't close the whole street, we're gonna close a lane in 60 days and if it doesn't work, we'll change it. Um, so actually, specifically, um, Mayor, to South First Street, where we came to uh, was that we're creating two extended parklets. And okay. for right now, that is going to serve, it's kind of the best of both worlds. The traffic is still able to go through. The businesses on the street that do want additional expanded seating are going to be able to go into the parking lane. And in fact, they're going to be able to go into um, the lane and the frontage in front of the California Theater. So they'll get additional expansion. Okay. And so what we've committed to do was take a look at how those parklets operate and to the extent that they need additional space, then either we look at the lane closure or we look at a full street closure. Okay, great. If you've got a solution, fantastic. Uh, I just, it, it just sounds as though it's um, getting challenging, um, bringing everybody to agreement. And I'd hate to think that the, that the threshold for us being able to move forward with this is gonna be consensus because we're just never gonna get the consensus. Yeah. I and think we're good on South First. They're going in tomorrow, actually, oh, okay. two parklets. <laughs> okay, I'll stop talking then. That's Kessler. okay. Councilor Jimenez, welcome. Yeah, 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 just a quick question, Blog A. Have you found that the majority of businesses that are registered are clustered near existing business associations and such? Or are they do we have uh, you know say in, in the burbs so to speak right in South San Jose and other places, and I know we're actively working to open up some of those spaces, but I, I would I would say um, I would say that the ones that are registering on private property are definitely those that are more um, that are kind of out in the burbs to to use your your words right those are the folks that are um, situated in kind of strip mall type settings and so they're the ones that have the parking lots and they have um, large enough parking lots where they could utilize 50% of their lots. Um, I would say for the sidewalk seating um, and for the parklets, those are more in kind of the traditional commercial business districts um, in D6 along Lincoln Avenue, downtown, um, and, and so on. Yeah, okay. The, the reason I ask is I often think that we need to you know, and so, some of it uh, incumbent upon me and, and other council members, but forming additional business districts across the city to try to get more buy-in. But, but there's some parts of the city, like District 2, for example, that there are no sort of this this continuous sort of row of like, you know, Alum Rock or East Santa Clara Street in which we can sort of build consensus with a lot of the businesses. It's more sporadic and you get some of these strip malls. And so I was just curious if, if this experience and this experiment of sorts 
has really exposed the need to, to, to create more of these business associations and things of that nature. I would tell you that it's, it is much easier to communicate with a cluster of businesses if you have a, an organization that is there and it has a relationship with them and is in con constant contact with them. Right. Um, so that is definitely the case. And I think, you know, right along the lines of what you're, what you were talking about, we were going to be bringing forward an item to council um, uh, regarding uh, a grant uh, that uh, we're applying for in the process of applying for uh, that would do just that, which is um, grow the potential for neighborhood business districts in other areas of the city, especially mm -hmm. areas that are, um, that have been significantly impacted uh, by COVID-19. And this is an opportunity for us to really strengthen that bench, so to speak. Right. Okay. All right. Thank you. I think that's a great idea. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Council Member Arenas. Thank you. Um, so this is really exciting. Um, I heard you say that there were 60 businesses already registered. Do you more or less have an idea where those 60 businesses are located? Um, I, 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 and I ultimately, do. <laughs> I'm interested in, in, in district data. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I do off the top of my head. I do not know how many are in district eight, but I certainly can get you that information. Yeah, I would be interested in, in learning um, if our businesses, because I do see some, some of our businesses going out into the parking lot and setting their um, seating. And I want to know whether they have a permit or not, not because, you know, uh, for any repercussions, but just so that we help them understand that, that there is a process for registration. They might see that all around town and think that it's just something um, that's allowed now. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that was important to me. Um, and also because I wanted to make sure that we send out information to our respective businesses um, so that they can have that information. Do you have a, a kind of a PR kit, if you will, for, for businesses so that we can forward? Yes, absolutely. We can, we can resend out um, to all of the, the council offices um, some information, some copy, uh, some links that you can utilize uh, in your communications. Wonderful. And I, I think you're right that, you know, there, there were some, um, I think people are still apprehensive as in terms of whether is this permitted, is this not permitted? I, nobody's really sure. There's some clawbacks uh, uh, because there's an increase in COVID cases. And so I know for um, like our hair salons, they were ready to go one day and then two days later they had to close back up, right? Um, so this is exciting that we're starting with with a lot of our restaurants. Um, one of the one of the ideas that I had, and actually I didn't have this. I'm going to um, uh, uh, so, uh, cite my source here, and that was Angel. Um, he had mentioned to me uh, a while back ago in in, in trying to um, revive our park in in one of our um, very impacted neighborhoods. Um, which is Welch, uh, we thought about, well, wouldn't it be nice to kind of have a, a, a cafe that, you know, the neighborhood association, the local neighborhood association would run and, you know, give, it would give an opportunity for neighbors to come together and, uh, you know, just create some, uh, and not, just a, a moment and opportunity and also some revenue to uh, keep up the, the place, right? And so, I wonder, would we lend ourselves out to to maybe some of our uh, city facilities, such as such as parks, to to allow some of our businesses to sell on site? I know that there are some mobile vendors that already do that, um, but couldn't we couldn't we have an arrangement with some some I don't know taco trucks or things of that sort or whatever businesses in our own uh, uh, respective backyard that we could offer an opportunity to sell their items at our local parks. Yeah, so council member, I do know that there are kind of a few things in the works uh, on a variety of different levels that uh, could kind of speak to what you're talking about. I think everybody um, agrees that, you know, there's, there's more opportunity for activation and certainly more revenue generating opportunity for our businesses, right? That's all something we wanna, we wanna work towards. So, so a couple of things um, next week, you'll likely be um, 
ratifying another order. <laughs> I'm on a roll with the orders, uh, another order uh, that the city manager signs um, that talks about expanding business operations into parks and plazas. Um, and that's mainly around um, health and fitness businesses, but it does also include uh, public eating establishments that are um, in close proximity uh, to the parks. So that, that's one thing kind of on a, on a temporary basis. Um, the, the second thing is that I know uh, the Parks Department is doing some work uh, through their capital group, exploring uh, kind of more permanent business operations, especially um, concessions in parks and how that might be um, feasible, working with the different constraints, kind of balancing this idea of, you know, public park for public use, um, but then at the same time, you have the, the balance of kind of private you know, uh, entrepreneurship, uh, revenue business, for-profit business operating in, in a public park. But I know that they are, they're starting to do some work um, around that. Um, and then I think the, the third thing to kind of speak um, more, uh, more immediately uh, is that the PRNS placemaking team is also having a variety of discussions with the different council offices um, and trying to assess their, their resources for placemaking activities to support business to the extent that we're able to. It's also kind of a fine line between having an event or holding activations that draw a number of people and at the same time um, making sure that we're complying with the county order. So at Solis and his placemaking team uh, um, are also doing work in that area. And I know that there was you know, specific budget allocation um, uh, to, to try to do some of those, those activations. So I, I, those are kind of the three, the three fronts um, mm -hmm. that are being worked on and there, there might be other fronts in the works, uh, but I think people are, are thinking about what you um, just mentioned for sure. So the, who's it, is it PRNS that's working on the health and fitness and some of the retail uh, or concession? So, is that? We, yeah, that is, it's um, the special parks use team uh, and PRNS along with us in economic development and um, and the CAO. So currently the order uh, that is on the table to, to be signed is uh, an order that primarily focuses on health and fitness businesses, kind of educational training, culture, day camps, um, cultural facilities, being able to bring out like these, for instance, if the Museum of Art um, wanted to have their art class or a class, they'd be able to do reserve a space in the park uh, to do that. Uh, and then also um, public eating establishments that are either uh, right on the, a downtown plaza or within a certain proximity of a park. So that, that's what's coming forward right now. Oh, right. Retail right. is not included in that. Mm -hmm. um, again, because we were really trying to streamline and also answer um, answer kind of the, the loudest and the most frequent requests that we were getting. And mostly we were getting requests for yeah. health and fitness businesses. Okay, well, that's great. Thank you for answering that question. Um, and so the last question that I have, I, I'm glad to hear, first of all, I'm, I'm glad to hear that we're gonna see this next week. I know that um, people are, are wanting to come out and, and you know spend some time just in the outdoors, um, no matter what it is. And, and they're sort of, you know, taking over our parks and a lot of our families who are overcrowded in some of our communities uh, need a bit of structure. And so I'm, I'm happy to hear that the placemaking team is, um, and hopefully that's part of Viva Parks. Um, some of our, our neighborhoods got used to having those placemaking opportunities as, as ways to um, have, you know, a really good time with their kiddos and not spend any money um, and stay, you know, really close to home. And so I'm looking forward to that. It's great. Uh, the, the other question that I had was, is there a different strategy? And I think you, you spoke uh, with uh, Council Member Jimenez about this and um, he used the verbs. I don't, I don't know if we're in the verbs, but we're definitely not downtown. And so um, if you could expand a little bit more in terms of of uh, what if the strategy is slightly different for um, 
for areas like mine. And I know that um, you said uh, that uh, the strip mall uh, strategy was kind of comes into play for some of the, some of our districts. Uh, they don't have the uh, uh, like the downtown feel, um, and so that what that was one of my questions. But if there's anything more to add, I, I'd like to hear if there was anything more that you would add to that that strategy. Are you working with any of the um, uh, like the you know main uh, businesses or main strip malls in, yes, in particular so, districts. Sorry about that. So specifically in your district, we have had um, a, a few conversations with the folks at Evergreen Village Square, and um, have have talked to them about kind of what's going to work best and what's uh, what is going to best support their businesses there. Um, and in in that case, they also have some kind of an internal. Um, checkoffs uh, through Chappelle that they wanted to take care of first before. Yeah, and, and I'm not necessarily worried oh. about them because they actually, through Chappelle, they have a, a hired consultant that is in charge of, mm -hmm. of, of carrying on these kinds of activities. So I'm not necessarily concerned about them. They already lend themselves the, the, the type of um, uh, downtown feel, if you will, for a village square already lends itself to this real easily. But I'm talking about some of those you know, the uh, more traditional strip malls uh, that you talked with uh, Council Member Jimenez earlier about. And so I wanted to know, are you targeting our, um, our strip malls differently? Are you maybe affording some, some funds for um, seating uh, arrangements that, you know, our business owners didn't necessarily have uh, because that's not the way their business worked? Um, it, it could be, you know, maybe a, a pizza uh, joint where it's mostly pickup, but now you can buy by the slice, and now you have a couple of chairs in front of the business. Um, so I'm just wondering, is there one? Is there any resource that we're giving to our businesses uh, to to comply with this, so that they could also do the same thing as downtown businesses? Sure. So and. And just to clarify, the street closure that we're doing and, and, and all of so far, everything that's kind of been implemented so far, um, it has been, the city has provided certain things, namely, like for instance, for the parklets, the barriers, or for the street closure, the barriers to close the street. Uh, but the businesses are providing all of the equipment, the tables, the chairs, the stanchions that they need, um, anything that they need to operate out in those areas. Um, that has all been provided uh, so far by the business. Um, similarly, the registrations that we've received for kind of the private parking lots and the private lots uh, in um, the, the strip malls, businesses have provided kind of the tables and chairs and brought all of their supplies outside. Um, the work that, that is uh, going to be happening through the PRNS placemaking team, I know that they um, have um, a small budget uh, to be able to purchase some of those kind of universally needed things. So some tables and chairs, some hand sanitizing stations. And I know that it is their um, intention to utilize that for some of the Viva Alfresco business support uh, activations. And I think that once um, those start to get underway and we see how those um, kind of shake out and we see uh, the resources that we have remaining, uh, we'll be able to, you know, figure out if we can maybe provide um, tables and chairs for folks. The, the one thing, though, is that we have to make sure that we can be as equitable as possible. And unfortunately, we don't have unlimited resources. And so, um, you know, we really have to have a conversation about how we would make sure that providing those resources um, are as equitable as possible. Um, thank you. You know, I have another question, but and it's very exclusive to district aid, and it has to do with Eastridge. And I know that only businesses with outward facing um, uh, uh, businesses can, can stay open in a mall. And so for for um, Eastridge, it's very limited. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's just basically two, two businesses that can actually do that. Um, and so uh, I wanted to maybe talk offline and see if there's something that we can um, do to help support um, uh, Eastridge in, in maybe taking some of their businesses outdoors. Mm -hmm. um, and we can take this offline. 
um, Blaj, I, I, I know that um, it, it's exclusive to, to District 8, but I know there's malls and other parts of, of the city of San Jose, and I'm not sure how everybody else is dealing with, with businesses, but I know for Eastridge, um, a lot of their uh, uh, people weren't really purchasing, you know, uh, uh, clothes and items. They were there to actually have a good time, like the, our bowling and the movies and uh, and a fitness center. And so um, a lot of those leisure type of, of businesses uh, would draw a crowd and now um, it's really changed. And so I, I'd be interested in just having a conversation offline to, to figure out how do we how do we um, help these folks survive through this. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Council Member Perales. Yeah, thank you as well. Um, and apologize. Uh, I'm back back at home, so the, the internet is a little slower here, so I'm off video. But thanks for the presentation and Blage for your work on this and city staff uh, for being able to move these opportunities forward. I know it has been uh, really great to see the number of businesses uh, that I have, not actually just downtown, but uh, throughout the city um, that have been utilizing outdoor seating. Not necessarily, uh, you know, exactly out fresco where you're on the sidewalk or you're shutting down um, some of the street. But even just utilizing outdoor space, some of the private locations that have used their own parking spots, right, and their own their own walkways out in front that you don't necessarily see on a normal basis. Uh, just across the street, for anybody that's right coming by City Hall, you can see it at Tostadas, right, using the sidewalk there. Um, I don't know if they got the permi permits or not, but uh, they did. They did. <laughs> oh, good. Okay. <laughs> I know a lot of people have jumped into using this uh, opportunity, right, as we I think expected. And then our hope was to get them to comply, right, um, with the with the proper permits. And so, uh, but we've seen this pop up, and there's just so many great examples of utilization of outdoor space. Um, and it's great; it's great to see people outside, right? Um, while obviously in the pandemic, socially distancing. Um, but yet, my hope, right, is that we can see a lot of this sustain even after the pandemic. And so, that's my first question for you, Blage, is what is the, is as far as these permits go and people that are getting permission to do this, what is the opportunity for them to continue uh, utilizing outdoor seating, at least along the sidewalks and other areas, if it's not roadways that, you know, that we're shutting down, uh, say we may re eventually or eventually reopen them. Uh, but what does it look like for ongoing purposes? So to, to be honest, we haven't had the specific conversation about what it looks like, um, you know, past December 31st. Um, which is the date that we've kind of we've put uh, that these temporary restrictions, um, you know, kind of uh, end. But I think, you know, as we get closer to that date, as we have more and more people utilizing outdoor um, seating or uh, business operations, we'll get more and more feedback. I know we'll likely be uh, receiving feedback through all of you. Uh, council members, and I think then we're going to be able to come back with a recommendation about how um, to potentially, you know, move forward uh, and not have this temporary relaxation of, of permits and fees uh, potentially end. So I think everybody's keeping a very open mind. We have to be very nimble. Things are changing um, constantly in the in the COVID situation, uh, and so we're kind of taking it all in, taking the feedback. Uh, and then as we get closer to that date, we'll, we'll figure out um, what makes the most sense and, you know, bring forward a recommendation. Yeah, I would hate to see this, you know, not be able to continue on, especially for businesses that are investing in making it work, right? A number of businesses are purchasing their, purchasing their own tables and chairs and umbrellas and whatnot for out, out, like outdoor use um, and just going through the process, right, with the city to be able to do this. Um, so that, that'll be my hope and that'll be something I'll be advocating for um, as we get to the end of the year, whether it's extending this on a temporary basis um, or looking more importantly, I think, for, uh, you know, a permanent uh, usage in some of these locations. Um, the, the next topic for me that's important and come up uh, already, which is just the, the I think, the uh, equitable opportunities across the city. Um, and I, again, I've seen uh this being taken advantage of across the city but i i'm not heading everywhere to every single district and so 
I do think that is important, especially when we're talking about areas uh, that are that are more under resourced. And um, Council Member um, Arenas was just talking about that, right? In D8, an, an area that may have better resources and may be able to take advantage of this, and there and there may be likely other areas that that won't. I know for certain we have that within the downtown core where we may not get a ton of businesses along say the east santa clara like Postales is great taking advantage of it how else can we get right more businesses to be able to take advantage of this in some other areas uh the mayor pointed out some of the challenges and so far i'm, I'm, I'm glad we're able we're going to be able to, to see that happen soon uh as you know blog I, I would love to see this happen along post street uh and i think one of the 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 challenges there is something that came out of uh, the task force recommendations which is, for instance, along Post Street, you only have a couple businesses that are actually on sort of facing Post Street. And, um, and, and so, you know, to have to shut down, say, Post Street or, or, or one lane, I think in that case, uh, makes more sense that the whole, the whole street, that section of the street there. Um, but you're only maybe benefiting those few businesses. And through the task force, the idea was, could there be an adjacent sort of something that somehow, right, you're, you're, you're a, a, a business away or a building away, um, could you be able to take advantage of, say, a vacant spot that's, that's, you know, along an area that's closed down? And so on Post Street, um, I think there's, there's a ton of opportunity um, where there are businesses right next to Post Street, maybe along First Street, uh, that we may never shut down that area of First Street. And so how can we create an opportunity for the businesses to, uh, you know, to be able to take advantage of space on Post Street? And, um, and so that's, you know, I, I'm thinking of, of places like Good Karma or uh, the Skewers and Bruce place that's right there and literally right next door um, to businesses that are adjacent like Cream and, and uh, 55. And so what is your thought in, in regards to that? Um, so it's a little bit, I, I agree, uh, with you that we want to try to maximize the number of businesses that are allowed or able to expand their business operations, um, without a doubt. Um, and, and that's really why we did the sidewalks and the private lots first, because we felt like that was going to really maximize people's opportunities. Um, and today, you know, we're here, uh, with an amendment to the, the sidewalk. A declaration which basically would allow a business to extend their tables and chairs in front of their neighboring businesses frontage as long as they have their um, their permission so you know for instance uh, there are a few businesses uh, along first street particularly whose neighbors are, are not open and they could potentially you know put out additional tables and chairs on two or three frontages that are not necessarily in front of their their business and so we're hoping that people um, do uh, take advantage of, of that you know, possible expansion. Um, I, I don't think anybody is opposed um, to trying to figure out kind of what the, what the right radius is or around a potential street closure. Um, I do think one of the things we, we wanna make sure of is if we do close a street, you know, that is um, uh, an investment kind of with the limited resources we have, we do want to make sure that people are going to, in fact, take advantage of closing that street. And we want them to, we want them to benefit, their business to benefit. And so it's, it's um, sometimes difficult when you maybe only have one or two businesses that could benefit from that street closure, as opposed to, let's say, on San Pedro, where you have nine or 10 businesses um, that benefit from, okay. from that street closure. So I think, I think though that um, we're able, as we um, are going through this, we're able to have additional conversations. I think that we can figure out um, you know, what the correct parameters are. I, I think one of the other things that we've tried to do is really streamline this in an effort to streamline this. The more detail you put in it, the potentially less streamlined it gets. <laughs> and so, um, you know, one of the questions, if we're going to say we're going to open it up to businesses that don't directly abut the street, is how far out do you go in that radius? And then do you run into a situation where businesses two or three blocks away are coming to a certain street to conduct their business? How does that then interact with a business that is right there abutting the street? 
So I think we can continue to talk through it um, and, and we will continue to talk through it and we will um, try to find the, the best solution uh, for the, the largest number of businesses across our city. But in, inevitably, and I, I think council member, you know this, inevitably, um, it's likely that we're not gonna be able to satisfy every single situation for every single person. Um, but we're gonna, we're gonna try our darndest to get as much as possible in there. Yeah, thank you for the, the response. And I, I do appreciate the progress we're having today with the item we'll be approving. I think we're all taking advantage of this opportunity to just talk about the alfresco in general. Um, and especially the street closure, which I think could add a lot of value more than, than just, you know, the space in front of your business on the sidewalk or uh, the ability to utilize a neighboring business's space on the sidewalk. Uh, shutting down a, uh, an entire street allows so much more opportunity. And to your point, right, that's a, it's a bigger investment on our part. So we definitely want to make sure, right, that that opportunity we're creating, gets fully taken advantage of. I, I, and that's why um, I think for me, it would be in, ensuring ways that we could fill up uh, a street that's closed um, and, and doing so, uh, you know, not at the same time, I think, running into to numerous challenges, as you point out well, who could get invited, right, to be able to use that. And uh, certainly there are things that, that we wanna be considering. And uh, I just wanna ensure that that's the, you know, continues to be the goal for, for staff. I know for me personally, we were already working on piloting shutting down of, of posts. So for me, it's, it's you know, whether we're doing an alfresco or not, I think there's, there's a great opportunity there. This alfresco opportunity um, just presents uh, a, another chance for us to to look at that area and and to see how we can get more businesses to participate in it, um, but the same thing could be said, right? When you talk about the equitable opportunity across the city, as you're looking at just other areas, uh, especially areas that may not uh, traditionally right have the resources to to band together. Uh, corridors, right? That don't have business associations or their or they're defunct or they're just not as active uh, and stuff like that. And so I do think that that um, should be something that we're thinking of. And, and I think it, you know, quite honestly could start with each of the council members, right? As they know their districts best to maybe make some suggestions, try to go out and, and help organize uh, some of those businesses and, and, and work with you uh, in city and a city staff to create some of those opportunities uh, in other areas. But, uh, you know, again, appreciate the progress for today. I think we're, we're continuing to move in the right direction uh, and uh, look forward to, to more of our businesses being able to take advantage. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Camus. Uh, thank you, Mayor. And I appreciate all the, the work that staff has done on this. I've actually uh, got this idea of trying to do things in parks from the day I stepped into office. And um, I'm glad that we're moving forward on it. I, I've been working with Angel on pilot programs here and there, and I'm glad we're moving forward. Um, when do you expect the parks uh, piece to move through, Blage? Um I anticipate that we're going to be bringing it to council for ratification next Tuesday. Yeah. Well, great. I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad we're moving forward. I wish it didn't have to take such a situation that we're in uh, to have moved it forward. Like I said, I, I thought that this was a, this could have been a great idea many, many years ago when I first stepped into office and then uh, I'm glad we're moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, my apologies. Uh, all right, are there any other questions? All right, we'll uh, vote then on the motion, Tony. Jimenez? Yes. Morales? Aye. Yep. Aye. Carrasco? Yes. Davis? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Camus? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Thank you. All right, uh, we'll move on then to item uh, 3.7.
Uh, thanks, Bogate. Uh, 3.7 is the public hearing for fiscal year 2021 sanitary sewer uh, service and use charge and storm sewer service charge assessments uh, for this fiscal year's county secured property tax roll. We'll open the public hearing at this time. Uh, there is no one intending to speak from the public. Are there any comments from the council? Uh, Ed, do I need to close the public comment or do I need to make a motion or something like that to do that? Well, no, you just have to, have to close it if there are no comments and then you can take your motion. Okay, no one from the public has indicated a desire to speak. So we'll close the public hearing at this time and then we need a motion to approve. Is that right, Ed? Yes. Move to, to approve. approve. Second. Okay, there were a lot of motions. I'm gonna give it to Councilmember Menace. Uh, on the motion, Tony? Jimenez? Yes. Corrales? Aye. Yep. Aye. Crosco? Aye. Davis? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Hamas? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. All right, the uh, 3.8 is a public hearing for this fiscal year's annual residential solid waste collection service charges for this year's Santa Clara County Secure Property Tax Roll. Uh, we'll have a public hearing at this time. Any member of the public would like to speak? I can see no one raised their real blue hands. And so uh, we'll close the public hearing. And we'll entertain a motion. So moved. Second. Second. All right, uh, I don't see any council member wanting to speak. Let's vote, Tony. Jimenez? Yes. Corrales? Aye. Yep. Aye. Crosco? Aye. Davis? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Hamas? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Okay, and then uh, in one more item, we'll come back to 3.5. So first, let's go to 3.9, which is termination of proclamation of local emergency for civil unrest. Is there a motion? Move to approve. Second. second. Motion and second. Mr. Beekman? Hi, thank you. Um, got my <coughs> letter here. As we were all brave and uncertain in the first days of the uh, protests and to respect a certain amount of early restraint SJPD may have had, at this point, I can't say enough in my dismay how SJPD could have handled the situation differently, both tactically and with everyday individuals during the protests. The Fremont Police Department chose not to assist the city of Oakland in mutual aid during the protests. They seemed to have a foresight to understand tear gas and COVID-19 would not be a good mix. The DOJ understandings of 2015 and 16 were finalized in conservative terms with a specific intention to develop its more progressive ideas. A thank you for Chief Garcia stepping down in terms of understanding it may be time for an SJ police chief to better develop more progressive community ideals. I hope San Jose city government, city council and community will no longer have to hide and we'll, we will all want to open up and how to be progressive and how to show the progressiveness that we actually are. From honest shared assessments, all of San Jose needs to be involved how a police chief can have a, a new police chief can have a clear good channel towards open progressive creative ideas for community. In SJPD, is SJPD, uh, San Jose government and ourselves ready to take the next steps on how to better handle protests and day-to-day -day relations with everyday community? Uh, Uh, the DOJ, uh, sorry, uh, hold on a sec. Uh, it, it may be consider our human relations and it may be to, to consider our human relations and our human uh, use of language that is what may be a real revolution at this time and part of a long-term problems and attitudes and policing and local city government itself that needs to be addressed. 
A simple uh, example of microcosm of San Jose, the usually decent intentions of public speakers is sometimes met with the surprising hostility and prejudice, prejudices of uh, SJPD city government and at, at SJ public meetings. Uh, I do feel for the past few years, San Jose city government has been trying to work on its own problems of a very narrow set of educational and class prejudices it has had of everyday community. I'm almost done. With the ideas of cooperation on all sides, I hope SJPD can understand that these are the better efforts by San Jose city government to address problems. I think this can be- Thank you. Uh, Catherine Hedges? Um, yes, as you, thanks very much for the opportunity to speak. Um, as you know, I've been very upset about the way that the police handled the alleged civil unrest and it's about time that we agree that we don't have an emergency anymore. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm turning to council, Councilmember Jimenez. Yeah, Mayor, thank you. I just simply wanted to say, I mean, it's obvious for those of us that are at City Hall that if you look out the window, you don't see folks protesting anymore, at least not the way it was happening before. But I, I think it's important to note that that by, that by no means suggests that people are comfortable with the way things are. And so, uh, I, I think it's uh, important to recognize some of the work that we've been doing. You know, I know there's a memo going to rules tomorrow, for example, related to the IPA. I mean, we just voted to put something on the ballot. So uh, I just wanted to express the folks that are listening, the folks that are on this call, that uh, that, that we hear you and that uh, although we're, we're sort of ending this uh, emergency, emergency declaration of civil unrest, we recognize there's a lot of work to do. And, and I just wanted to put, put, that, put that out there because I think it's important to take notice of that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, moving on. All right, uh, Mr. Soto. Uh, good evening, Council. Um, this is this is one of the reasons why I wanted Eddie Garcia to stay there, is because what he's happened, what has happened under his watch, is he's created a culture where it was permissible to perceive the public and the public exercising their First Amendment right as enemy combatants. And, the, and how I support that is Jerry Gwynn's behavior. This man was standing there in full tactical gear with a deadly weapon in his hand, and this dude was fired up. We still haven't even explored the sadism that exists in the police department, and I support that by be, by that Facebook page that allowed these people to dehumanize the very people that they are in charge of protecting. This is this is the system that we're dealing with. This is how this is how sick and insidious it is. And for that man to escape, and basically that's what he's doing. He's escaping his responsibility to sit there and listen to the public and take his lumps. That's his duty. He owes me that. As a citizen of this city, he owes me that. And like a coward, he's going and he's running. He's running and he's evading his responsibility. The very responsibility that the police department holds the public to account for. If you break a law, oh, they're gonna, they're gonna get you and they're gonna wrestle you down to the ground and make sure that you are held accountable to what it is that you've done to society. Well, how come he can't stand there and allow us to do the same thing with him when he's accountable for what happened to society? Because as a society, we're going to pay the money. Believe me, that man that lost his testicle, believe me, the city's going to be paying millions of dollars to that dude and all the other victims. But yet we're the one that's footing the bill and he's the one that created the culture. So this is bigger. I mean, this, this system, we can no longer function as a society with the system that has been put in place. It has to change. And this euphemistic language that's used to describe it has to change. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And finally, Mr. Largent. Great. Um, thank you. I, I do appreciate you taking my uh, my comment. I did put my hand up a little uh, little late on things, so I do appreciate that. Um, I uh, I am born and raised in San Jose. I care about San Jose a lot. Now, when we're on, we uh, we understand that things went all wrong during the protesting. We, we we know the city made mistakes. We know the PD made mistakes. M my concern right now is it's just going to keep happening over and over again. Many of you know, 
I, I, I talk to a lot of people and I spend a lot of time over at the police department trying to engage with officers and I've gotten to know them really well. There's only a handful of them that really think what happened downtown was, was wrong. Now, what I've been trying to do um, is, is make them understand things from a protester's eyes, make them understand things from a legal observer's eyes, make them, you know, just, you know, a, a good civil conversation back and forth. Until we actually are able to investigate these officers properly, nothing is, is ever going to change here in San Jose. Uh, I know we have a lot on the table right now. A lot of things are being discussed. Uh, I just don't think it's going to change. I'm sorry to say that. Why don't we take a page, and there's nothing wrong with doing this. The Sheriff's Department had a lot of problems four or five years ago. There was a lot of things that happened with our jails and our training, uh, the correctional officers. It was, it was bad news. The Sheriff's Department did a 180, and they dealt with me for two years hammering on them in public comment. I wanted it changed. I wanted them completing the programs. I wanted them doing the bias training. Why can't we learn from them? Because right now, when I'm putting together more of these videos, I don't have any misconduct from the Santa Clara County Sheriff's Department at that protest. But I have hundreds of individual instances that are just shocking to see, and, and they shouldn't antagonize the public. They shouldn't upset them. They shouldn't say the things they were saying. So you guys get the point. So thank you for taking my comment. I do appreciate that. Thank you. All right, return to council. Uh, Councilmember Mendes, uh, you had already spoken. Did you want to speak again? No, no. Okay. Uh, all right, then on the on the motion, let's vote. Mendes? Yes. Prowlis? Aye. Diep? Aye. Crosco? Aye. Davis? Aye. Ms. Barza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Emmis? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. All right. We're going to recall now the item, uh, not recall, we're going to return to the item 3.5. Um, and I just want to thank again Mark Vanny, who has been working around the clock for for several weeks now to deal with various charter change potential issues uh, and has been rummaging through the charters. I believe Ed Moran has as well. And so thank you for your review. Um, I just wanted to uh, ensure we make a clear record about legislative intent before we, we take this vote, because I suspect uh, there will be plenty of questions that will come up eventually. Uh, and so, you know, Mark or Ed, whoever would like to respond, have you had a chance to review uh, the charter provisions to determine whether or not you think there's anything in there that would create uh, a contradiction uh, to uh, <clears throat> that would undermine the efforts of the council to enact a muni code provision uh, that would empower the IPA with investigation authority. So let me let me just make a comment and, and Mark can, can make additional comments and again I also want to I also appreciate Mark and a couple of the other attorneys in our office in this short time looking through to try to see if we can come up with a comment that would that the, the council would, would um, accept. And, and, and what I can say Mayor is that we reviewed the charter and we don't see any provision that will directly prohibit the granting of the IPA additional authority over investigations subject to the meet and confer of the POA. But again, that is in contrast to the city manager's authority to discipline employees, which is specifically mentioned and therefore couldn't be given to the IPA. Okay. Thank you for that, Ed. Um, and so if you'll beg my, uh, beg my uh, colleagues indulgence, I just want to be explicit about this on the record. So although Section 411 clearly indicates that council can't meddle in the administrative matters of, of the city manager uh, without a council vote. Um, Section 411 would not stand as a barrier to council enactment of an immunity code provision that would, in, would vest investigation authority with the IPA, is that right? After our review, it, it, we don't see that that provision would directly prohibit the granting of that authority. Okay. And similarly with 809A, which 
authorizes the IPA to do some things, but not other things. Uh, you don't see that as being an obstacle either. Uh, no, we don't because um, that additional language in F only uses the charter as a limitation, not the language in 809. Okay, great. And then section 701A of the charter, which relates to see it, the city manager's authority to discipline, uh, you don't believe that will interfere with a grant of investigatory authority to the IPA? So long as the investigation is separate from any disciplinary action that the, that the, the, P, the IPA cannot have any disciplinary action. Um, it, it, it does not. However, we want to make clear that there may be some limitations with regard to um, the roles um, only uh, under the MOA that they have with the, with the POA. So I, I'm simply looking at the charter. I have, we haven't looked at any other language yeah. of any other contract, which would simply be a contractual obligation. It would not be a limitation on your authority under the charter. Agreed, Ed. Let's put aside any other issues, state law, contractual right. issues. Simply for just looking at the charter, we did not find any other provision which would limit your authority to provide additional duties to the IPA okay. uh, with this language. Thank you. And again, forgive me for being having to be specific in a way that may sound redundant, but I just need to make this record. I think it's important to do it on the record. Uh, Section 701B, which governs the city manager's ability to direct and supervise employees, uh, you conclude that that does not interfere in any way with um, a grant of investigatory authority to the IPA. We don't think that that prohibits the ability of the IPA to do investigations. Um, okay. Yeah, the, the, the PD. Okay, great. I, I just thank you for putting up with me being so ponderous. I just feel it's very important because this will, I'm sure, come up. Uh, Monk, did you want to add anything? No, I think uh, I, I think Ed has <coughs> said it well. Um, you know, we didn't find anything that directly prohibited or conflicted with granting the IPA additional authority or a greater role in investigations, um, so I, I agree with Ed. Okay, great, thank you, Mark. Uh, the motion then is Vice Mayor Jones. Um, Ed, is there anything else we need as part of yes, that? Yes, you, you have to go through the same list that you did before. Yeah. Is, is uh, So you've agreed that you're going to combine all three into one and we've given you the question um, that, um, that you've revised by taking out a word. Um, so th then the question is, um, do you want to allow rebuttals with regard to this particular ballot measure? I believe Vice Mayor Jones would say no rebuttal. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Do you want to do a summary in the Mercury News or do you want to uh, uh, provide the full text in the printed material? Uh, just to be consistent, uh, I'll, I'll say a summary. Yeah. Okay. And then um, do you want to designate a member of the council to be to write the argument in favor of the ballot measure. Yes, uh, I'll designate the mayor. Thank you, and I'll indicate. I obviously, I know several of you have been deeply invested in each of these issues, so we'll be working with your offices in in drafting uh, any arguments. Okay, and then the other ones are simply direction to the city attorney to draft an impartial analysis, and the others to the city clerk to forward this um, ballot measure to the register and do any other actions necessary to put this on the ballot in November. Okay. Uh, and I, the impartial analysis is required. Is that right, Ed? Yes, it is. Okay. So that's part of the motion. Is that right, Vice Mayor? That's correct. Okay. And the seconder, forgive me. I don't know who that was. Yes, I agree with all that, Mayor. Okay, great. Thank you, Councilman Matters. All right, let's vote on the motion. Thank you, everyone. Jimenez? Yes. Perales? Aye. Dieppe? Aye. Carrasco? Aye. Davis? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Gamas? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Thank you. Okay. We're off to the ballot.
Thank you, everyone. Thanks for your patience. Um, and thank you, Mark, for all your help. And Ed, I think you both. Uh, all right, item 310 uh, are actions related to the 2020 Coronavirus Emergency Supplemental Funding Program grant funds received from the U.S. Department of Justice. Is there a motion? Move to approve. Thank you. Mr. Beekman? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, for this item, I just wanted to try to quickly offer that uh, it's my understanding uh, there's going to be some uh, possible vaccines that will be ready for everyday people, uh, you know, late fall. And um, it, it's, it's so that that's a very hopeful idea and thought. I don't know how accurate it is. Um, but it's from that that I've been told that the vaccine itself will not exactly be uh, what the term is a silver bullet. And that so you may get the vaccine and be, you know, safe for maybe six months, you know, eight months to a year. But by the next flu season, you can be vulnerable again to it. And that's I, I've heard that's, you know, the conditions of what's happening right now. And so that invites the rolling tumbling question of, of this of this disease and uh you know I, I i just good luck in how we have to work on this and and that we work for a cure and uh we don't uh dilly dally and just let other things take over our lives because of this i don't think it's worth it and and i hope we're all learning our important lessons of positive sustainability where i hear that language being talked about more that we don't have to work on these sort of ideas of social planning anymore. We can talk about social planning just in warmth and in love and what we need to do for each other instead of having to go through these uh, patterns of disease in order to accomplish large goals that we set for ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, returning to council. Uh, Councilmember Davis. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I have one question for staff, and it was that the the recommendation um, is to allocate the the appropriation to the police department, but that did not the recommendation was not consistent with the or did not appear to me to be consistent with the analysis, which said that about half of it was go going to go to the fire department. So I'm confused as to the recommendation versus the the analysis in the um in the memo itself can somebody clarify that for me please um yes council member i I'm, if we have staff on board i think i saw lisa perez um yes i'm here yes thank you lisa could uh, you could, did you hear the council member's question yes so the budget for the we will manage the grant in the police department and reimburse fire for their expenses great thank you that's all the clarification i needed okay uh any other comments or questions and there is a motion uh i believe so let's vote jimenez yes oh Wait, I don't have a motion or a second. You don't? We approve. Second. Thank you, Councilman Jimenez. And now Jimenez. <laughs> Perales? Yes. Aye. Yep. Aye. Crosco? Aye. Davis? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Chemis? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo. Aye. All right. Uh, we're on to 4.1, which is release of police department video clips related to recent protests. Uh, and just to clarify something, when I read the agenda, it appeared it was information only, accepting a report. Do we have any ability to take action? Um, you can ask the, the city manager to come back with additional information, um, but you can't take an action since the action is not specified, but you can ask him to come back with whatever information you want and you can take action at a future date. Okay. I, I would ask that 
whoever might make the motion might consider bringing this back for council action uh, and consolidating it with uh, anticipated what should be coming out of the rules committee would be some additional direction regarding uh, video clips and the protests. Uh, I would like to take action of some kind because I, I wasn't particularly satisfied with the report. Um, and I think there's pretty conclusory reasons offered for why a video wouldn't be provided right away. And I, I think this is important for the council to be able to take action in this. Uh, and so I, I put that out there for the maker of the motion. Um, is, are there any, uh, is there any presentation here, Dave, before we go to the public? No, we're uh, staffs available for questions and, and certainly mayor, I, I know some of the concerns that you've raised in the past. And so we, we do have a, a, a conversation going with the attorney's office and the police department with regard to that. And certainly, uh, as you mentioned, it is included uh, as direction in the rules item tomorrow. So uh, we certainly look forward to coming back with, with that information. Okay. Um, so we could consolidate those items when we come back. Uh, Absolutely. So Thank you, Dave. Let's go to the public and then uh, we can figure out what to do next. Uh, JT? Yeah, just a quick comment. I really don't think we should even have to ask this. Why don't we make San Jose truly transparent and always make all police video available? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Largent. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Scott Largent. I, I agree with what the gentleman, the previous speaker before me. I, I, don't, I don't see why we just cannot make this information public immediately. What do we have to hide right now? Why can't we just get it out there? We can all see what really happened. Um, I, I was at almost every single protest that was downtown. Uh, I'm a legal observer. I have just unbelievable videos and I'm just overwhelmed with processing all this stuff, trying to get it out there onto the internet. The point is not just to make the San Jose Police Department look really bad. Um, it's to get the bad apples disciplined. It's to show what went wrong. Um, any and all of you are welcome to this footage. Um, you know, do we need to wait around for a lawsuit or the POA to release it? You know, we're going to go back and forth for years on this stuff before it gets out there. I'll provide it to you. I was right up in there, and I'd say I probably have about 300 different um, incidents that happen that, that, that are just shocking. The language, the violence, the uh, – you, you guys can go on YouTube and watch it. Um, I don't have the time to be doing all this. So does anybody want it? Um, you know, I put it in your hand. You can make up your own decision. You can say, hey, great. We're front row seat to the protest. We'll know what happened. Um, I believe it's 31 days of footage. So got a lot of stuff. So um, anybody else is more than welcome to have access to that. Uh, you know how to get a hold of me. Uh, you guys know my email. You know my phone number. Um, the only problem about this is the public will get a hold of me. Nobody in power is going to call me right now. You guys don't want to see the truth, which, which I don't really understand. Oh, I'm sorry. One of you wants to see the truth. Sergio wanted to see the truth. Thank you. Mr. Largent, I encourage you strongly to submit the videotape that you might have that raises any concerns or complaints to the independent police auditor uh, that, who has specifically upgraded her capacity to store video files as a result of a budgetary allocation the council made for this very purpose because we're aware that there's a lot of video out there relating to the protest. So if you or anyone else has video evidence that you'd like to submit of anything forming the basis of a complaint, the IPA, uh, the independent police auditor will take that evidence uh, and, uh, and file a complaint on that basis. All right, Mr. Soto. Good evening, Council. Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. I was at that protest and in the beginning, it was fine. That's what, what, what was like, like kind of surprising to me was because in the beginning we marched, we got in the middle of the street, walked down Santa Clara, then we walked down 4th Street, and everybody was just like, yeah, man, yeah, this is not acceptable, and everybody was walking, everybody was fine, every until the police showed up. And I'm telling you, this is a militarized, in fact, Dwyer was the one that gave it. 
Dwyer stated that this is a war zone and that, that I have never, I've been to Iraq, Afghanistan, ni como todo, and stating that somehow or another, this was a war zone. There's your clue. Because he considered it that, maybe he's got PTSD and doesn't even know it, which is why we need psychological profiles on all these cops. That's why we need SB 1421. You know, with respect to, I'm very sorry that what happened to what, what, what happened to all of these people that were victimized, I as a citizen was victimized because I had to sit down and watch on the news my city be, being terrorized by officers that have been conditioned to perceive citizens as enemy combatants. If you go to Iraq and get some footage from Iraq in the way that those soldiers treated those citizens in Iraq by Blackwater, who was ran by Eric Prince, whose sister is now Betsy DeVos. Believe me, I connect the dots, man. I'm not an ignorant man. I got all day to read books, all day. So what has happened is this militarization of the police departments, and that is the approach that they have with the citizens, enemy combatants, the kinds of weapons that are used, the tear gas, the approach, the front line, the, uh, the, the, the corralling of people. These are all tactical measures in order to incite violence. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Beekman. All right, thank you. Uh, I hope the upcoming questions of what can be public access to police department uh, body camera footage during the recent proposal uh, protests can also help develop uh, how everyday people can eventually have better access to police body camera footage and realistic day-to-day -day needs as well. The January 22nd, 2020 Rules in Open Government meeting had a public hearing. Can a, pension, can a person from San Jose who is currently making a court appeal have body camera footage to help his defense case? It was ruled at the, at the RAOG OG meeting and public hearing that day that he could not have the body camera footage. It was a fairly standard judgment. It also felt in the room that this standard could be questionable. Uh, to bring out these questions into the open of what can be the public's right to body camera footage seems the intention of San Jose City Government to have this Jan January 22nd, 22nd public hearing in the first place. So this is an issue that is already on people's minds. The question is, what do we want to do about it at this time? And how can the public be allowed the right to see body camera footage to prepare for their own court trials? along with similar important needs and other reasons. Uh, this should make for some, some decent good connections with the current public ask of, of police body camera footage from the protest. Thank you. Thank you. Catherine Hedges. Um, yes, thank you very much. Um, I agree with the previous speakers that we need to release the police footage for transparency. Um, the city can't be hiding what happened. Um, I really, yeah, I really don't have a lot to add. I just agree that we need to share the footage that the police department has. And I'm glad that the city upgraded the storage for the IPA to get footage from the public too, but we shouldn't have to depend on the public and we need to see documentation of things like the official photographers getting roughed up by police. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, returning to council. Um, so as was noted, there is an item on the rules committee now that would be coming to council. So uh, we could uh, defer this item be considered with it um, rather than accepting the report if the council so chooses. Uh, council member, Anyone like to speak? <laughs> I'll move to defer the item and attach it to the item coming, making its way through the rules committee. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Uh, all right, council member Menes, is the motion, seconder of the vice mayor uh, on that motion. Tony? Yeah, Jimenez? Yes. Rallis? Rallis? Aye. Yep. I'm snorting. <laughs> yep. Crosco? Has one job. Yes. 
Davis? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Camas? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Going back to Depp? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, item 5.1 is the continued financial relief and amendment to concession agreements for non-aeronautical concessionaires at the airport. Uh, there's no presentation here. Is there a motion? Move to approve. Second. Second. All right, I right. see so no one the public would like to speak on the motion, Tony? Jimenez? Yes. Prowlis? Aye. Yep. Aye. Aye. Roscoe? Aye. Davis? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Yemis? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Thank you. All right. Item point, point two is uh, a similar item relating to continued financial relief, but for on airport rental car operations agreements and lease. Move rent. approval. Thank you. Uh, no one from the public like to speak. Uh, let's vote. Is that Foley or Davis who made the motion? Foley. Yeah. Okay, that's what I thought. Jimenez? Yes. Prowlis? Aye. Yep. Aye. Crosco? Aye. Davis? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Aye. Foley? Aye. Yemis? Yes. Jones? Aye. Licardo. Aye. Okay, um, 5.3 is the public hearing for support of COVID international services. Move to approve. Second. All right, there's a motion and second. Uh, no public comment. No one else like to comment. Let's vote. Jimenez? Yes. Rowles? Aye. Yep. Aye. Crosco? Aye. Davis? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Aye. Foley? Aye. Camus? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Uh, item 8.1 are the amendments to the city assistance participation plan. There's no presentation. Is there a motion? Move, Move to approve. approve. Second. Oh. Motion and second. Uh, there's no member of the public like to speak. Uh, Tony? Jimenez? Yes. Corrales? Aye. Dip? Aye. Roscoe? Aye. Davis? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Aye. Foley? Aye. Yemis? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. All right, uh, item 8.2 is a public hearing uh, for the draft 2020 to 2025 consolidated plan and draft fiscal year uh, 2021 annual action plan. Uh, we're gonna open the public hearing at this time. Uh, we're not gonna close the public hearing, however, because there uh, is an additional item on next week's agenda, but we will hear a presentation, is that right, Jackie? Yes, you will hear a presentation. Let me share my screen. And so great. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Um, Jackie Morales Rand. I am the De director of housing and I am joined tonight by Reagan Henninger, uh, who's the deputy director. And we're here to review the draft of the five-year 2025 consolidated plan and this year's annual action plan. And this is the first of three public meetings that we're holding on these two plans. So just to remind you, what is the consolidated plan? Um, it supports five individual uh, annual action plans that we uh, use to implement the five-year plan. 
And again, today we're gonna to be presenting the first year of the annual action plan, which is done concurrently. There are uh, four different funding programs that we receive through HUD. Uh, the first one is the Community Development Block Grant, and it's the most flexible. Flexible, of course, we're talking about federal funds, so we have to put that into the context of flexibility. Uh, but it can be used to support community development and public service activities. The home program is really uh, targeted towards building affordable apartments and rental assistance. The HOPWA program is to support uh, people with AIDS. And then the Emergency Solutions Grant Program is HUD's funding that we're using to respond to the homeless crisis in our community. So our process to date, we actually started it in September of 2018 with the county and other cities in Santa Clara County. We did a regional uh, coordination and plan. Uh, and then the city of San Jose did additional outreach in order to ensure that our community was engaged. Um, we would have liked to have had a longer public comment period, but we are using, utilizing HUD waivers. Um, and we only recently received our ESG CARES allocation. So this would, is not our typical timeline, but actually we would have completed all of our work before your July 1st recess. But again, because the department has been so engaged in the COVID-19 response, and because of the additional money we've been receiving, uh, we have, it has delayed our plan. So as you can see, uh, we did release though, a draft of the consolidated plan back in July. So in terms of our community engagement, uh, we have staff has worked with the local community-based organizations to hold 21 focus groups and small stakeholder meetings. These smaller format meetings really help to ensure that feedback was obtained from community members who don't traditionally feel comfortable uh, either participating in online surveys or who don't come to city-sponsored outreach meetings. So the housing department uh, met uh, with, for example, uh, the Office of Education six times, the Santa Clara County Office of Education six times since late March to continue to discuss the evolving needs of homeless and at-risk children and their families during the COVID-19 health crisis. In total, approximately 308 people participated in public focus group meetings and 648 San Jose residents responded to the countywide survey for a total of close to a thousand residents who participated in our process. Um, we also hired interpreters uh, for Spanish and Vietnamese outreach meetings. And we are, uh, when we send out all of our HUD notices, we translate them in Spanish, Vietnamese, Mandarin, and Cantonese. And uh, we have agencies that do and staff that are able to interpret. So um, wrapped up in our federal funding, we have tried to be responsive to COVID-19 and move as much of our money towards addressing the pandemic. And so while we didn't complete the five-year plan before the July break, we did take significant action, as you can see here, on April 21st and July 1st uh, to move money quickly in order to address COVID-19. We just wanted to highlight some of the things that we saw that's in the analysis that's included in the uh, consolidated plan, uh, that the needs for low-income residents are particularly impacted. Uh, we see that 45% earn lower incomes of the total households in San Jose. We see small families, which are four or fewer, and we should be clear, it doesn't uh, distinguish in the data that we get, whether this is families with children or if it's extended families, but small families of four or fewer represent 36% of the households. Uh, we clearly see substandard housing, overcrowding and rent burdened as being a significant issue and it's particularly overcrowding. And, and I know you all know that because I hear it every day on item 3.1, I mean, every Tuesday. So I know the council is aware of these issues. We also just wanted to highlight that um, there are some areas where the analysis showed disproportionality 
uh, based on race and ethnicity. So 28% of Black and African American households spend more than half of their income on housing costs, and 25% of Latinx households spend more than half of their income on housing costs, and those are higher percentages than other uh, race and ethnic categories. Uh, in terms of reporting one or more housing problems, uh, Pacific Islanders and American Indian Alaskan Natives reported uh, more housing problems than any other race or ethnicity. In terms of the 2025 Consolidated Plan goals, uh, three of them are the one are were included in last year's plan. So we're going to continue to focus on homelessness, affordable housing, and fair housing. But we did change one of the goals based on our community input and outreach, and also because of COVID-19. And this goal really focuses on strengthening and stabilizing our communities and really growing assets. That's a new goal that we haven't had in the past. So in terms of the available funding. You can see through our new allocation, um, of which that includes close to $33 million in ESG CARES, we are programming $47 million in a new allocation. We had $5 million in a carryover, and we're anticipating that we'll get some repayments during this time period, which provides a budget of $54 million that we are uh, planning in the first annual action plan. I did want to just highlight what the annual action plan has in it. So the majority of the investments are not new. They are a continuation from the last five-year plan. And that's because we are not finishing and wrapping up this plan until now. And so we are planning on issuing RFPs in the future. So we carried forward most of the contracts, except for two. And um, those contracts will be, we are going to be issuing an RFP this year for a job training program for our, our unhoused residents, and we will be issuing an RMP for a new rental assistance provider. But other than that, the public service contracts are all moving forward as based on last year's allocations. What is new this year is we are setting aside 850,000 for childcare with a plan to commit a total of $1 million. We are committing 2.1 to the Yerba Buena Community Wi-Fi Network. We talked about it before the break. We are committing 2.6 million in COVID-19 uh, uh, to support COVID-19 impacted excluded workers. Uh, and we started that uh, movement before the July break and this is the remainder of that commitment. We are investing $36 million to address homelessness in this plan. That includes the ESG, both our normal ESG, our home money, our CDBG money, and the new ESG CARES money. And then we have $15 million of programming where families can apply for funding. So here's the list of all the CDBG activities. Again, this should all look familiar. Um, you can see we increased job training to $950,000 because we're going to be issuing a new RFP in that area. For the home activities, you can see again, the tenant-based rental assistance for the COVID-19 at 2.6. And then we have some money set aside for ho affordable housing development. A HAPA, this is um, 1.4 million for rental assistance, which is how we typically spend our HAPA funds. Our ESG, this is our annual ESG allocation. You can see we don't typically get $32 million. It's less than a million. We are continuing to support our PATH, which is our downtown outreach, the Bill Wilson Center for Youth, and then the HMIS system, which provides us data on all of our homeless activities. And I'm going to turn it over now to Reagan, who's going to, to review with you how we plan on spending our $32 million. Great. Thanks, Jackie. Good evening, Council. I'm here with my co-presenter, Ella. Um, so during the, <laughs> during the uh, COVID-19 public health crisis, the Centers for Disease Control has recommended that if individual 
um, shelter housing options are not available, that people who are living unsheltered or encampments should remain where they are. And then there's further CDC guidance that recommends cities form community coalitions to improve uh, street-based services and conditions in encampments. So in response, our city's EOC has suspended abatements to advance this public health guidance. And locally, Valley Homeless Healthcare and Public Health have begun testing at congregate shelters and in encampments of 10 or more people. And allowing people living in encampments to remain where they are has helped people maintain critical service and medical connections as well as allow for contact tracing. While we've been able to provide support to encampments during this public health crisis, we're proposing to lean in even more and provide more street-based services. The housing department and the county office of supportive housing have been participating in weekly technical assistance calls with HUD funded advisors to develop a coordinated approach to all of our federal stimulus money. Our city and county coordinated investment plan leverages our resources to ensure a balanced approach of meeting a diverse set of needs. And one of our coordinated approaches is focusing our ESG CARES funds on programs and services for the unsheltered. So the housing department is piloting a new program called SOAR, which stands for Services, Outreach, Assistance, and Resources, in partnership with our EOC's Beautify San Jose branch. The program is focused on 17 of the city's largest encampments, and large is defined as 50 or more people. So we're estimating approximately 600 people could be served by this program. The three components are street-based outreach and services. And so this would fund new dedicated street outreach teams with clinicians and folks experienced in drug and, al drug and alcohol uh, counseling. It would focus on increasing our uh, hygiene and inf infection control with things like increased trash service and large item debris removal as well as increasing our porta potty and hand washing stations. And then finally, there's a housing uh, and shelter opportunities, which includes uh, motels, shelter beds, and our emergency interim housing. Next slide. So I'm gonna detail our uh, proposed expenditure plan. So the first component, as I mentioned, the shelter and outreach, this would fund PATH and Home First for dedicated street outreach teams. We're proposing a street-based storage program for folks living in these 17 large encampments, uh, really trying to get storage as close to where people are encamped. And then uh, the other service component is community engagement. One thing we've been able to do during our uh, public health and emergency response is coordinate with some of our community volunteers and community organizations on encampment outreach. We've been able to supply community volunteers with who do regular outreach in encampments. We've been able to su supply them with things like PPE, hand sanitizer, solar phone chargers, water, and we've also been coordinating on geographic locations so that we can reach as many people in encampments as possible. We've piloted a small meal delivery program with the Lived Experience Advisory Board and PATH. We'd like to continue this coordination, but also increase it so that we're able to provide more supplies and work with more community groups. The second component is that trash support at encampments. We've been able to provide a weekly service right now, but we would love to do things like supplying dumpsters, doing uh, regular large item debris removal, supplementing things like our trash for cash. And while this 2.7 million funded by the ESG CARES program is focused on these 17 largest encampments, we know it's not enough. 
uh, we have a whole other EOC branch that's dedicated to serving um, and providing trash support at encampment sites throughout the city in such places as Mervyn's Way, Rose Avenue, Monterey Road. And finally, we've placed porta potties and hand washing stations at encampments back in March, but we know we need to increase this level of service and this funding will allow us to provide additional porta potties and increase the frequency of servicing. Next slide. And finally, where the majority of these funds are focused on are housing and shelter opportunities. We are currently operating South Hall as a temporary emergency shelter. We'd love to continue this through um, December at least and also increase the bed capacity at South Hall. We're proposing a motel voucher program that's such a critical tool for our street outreach teams. We continually hear that feedback from our street outreach workers, as well as those who are living in encampments that access to emergency hotel stays is so critical. For some people, a shelter stay isn't going to be the best fit for their uh, physical or emotional well-being, And that's when a hotel room really is um, quite critical. And later this month and into September, we'll be opening our emergency interim housing sites that the EOC has been working furiously on. And while we redirected HAP funding to construct those e EIH sites, this ESG CARES money will provide much needed operation and services funding, as well as operation and services funding for our bridge housing communities at Mayberry and later this year at Felipe. We're also proposing additional Funding for our rapid rehousing program, that's a time limited rental subsidy with case management. And then finally, we're funding a shelter diversion, or as we call it, housing problem solving, which is case management and some modest financial assistance to help individuals identify an immediate housing opportunity that's not shelter. For example, a roommate or staying with friends or family. We've already started this diversion work and coordination with the county and our HUD uh, technical advisors by developing a coordinated program and outcomes. So that's the summary of our SOAR program. We really think this approach of street-based outreach and services, hygiene and trash, along with housing and shelter opportunities provides a compassionate approach to addressing the health and safety needs of people living outside um, during this public health crisis. And I think I'm turning it over to Jackie for next steps. Great, so this is our first uh, public hearing. Uh, we are gonna be holding a, our first virtual public hearing on August 6th. We will come back next week for and um, ask for your approval on the plan and for you to take action. And then we will be submitting both plans to HUD on August 15th. And before I turn it back to the city council and the mayor, I did want to recognize the tremendous amount of work from the staff, uh, Kristen Clements, who has the division manager for this team, uh, and Shirley and April, who are implementing uh, the HUD programs. Uh, as you know, the last time you saw me, I told you Robert was leaving. So uh, Shirley's had to jump in and take over a team. And then uh, Kelly from, who's the, our homeless manager, uh, who has been working on the outreach, especially toward, uh, especially in getting our homeless residents uh, engaged uh, in providing us feedback. And so with that, we are available for questions and thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jackie, and Greg, and, and Ella. All right, uh, we're going to go to the community first. Uh, Mr. Beekman. Hi, thank you. Um, thank you for this, uh, for the public hearings you're going to have. Uh, I'm really into public, uh, not public housing, uh, mixed income housing. And that was a movement that I felt was really coming on in 2019, and I was really hopeful about it. And I, I'm, I would like to learn 
how that can be talked about at this time. Uh, how can we redevelop those concepts and put it in a context that's, you know, towards our future? I don't, I don't know what that is. Everything's a little foggy to me right now. But it's such great ideas that I, I you know, I hope you'll be talking about mixed income uh, and just what the ideas of sustainability it offers. I think it's the real ideas of sustainability and the ideas of how to talk about community and the future of community and policing and all of those good things, community energy. You know, it just does a ton of stuff towards community sustainability. And um, I'm a bit fearful that your meeting was, uh, that your public meeting that you're going to have on, on Thursday will conflict with the uh, VTA public meeting. Uh, you know, they work on serious mixed income housing issues as well. And uh, it's, it's a shame that that, if that would uh, conflict with each other. Um, with 42 seconds, I, I just wanted to... Uh, Thank uh, the mayor uh, and his budget ideas towards uh, deficit reduction. Uh, they're similar to what Gavin Newsom practices as well with school, school budgets. School budgets will not be, uh, they'll be having a, a steady COLA process for the next year using deficit reduction practices. And, um, you know, I think that, that's an important lesson for the, the POA at this time. And, all, and for all of us. And I just wanted to again thank, you know, it, it's good foresight to practice deficit reduction in this time period. And it, it just sets a, it, a good course. And, and I feel safe and secure in, in him doing that and, and everyone doing that. And Democrats doing that is doing it very well. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Paul Soto. Good evening, Council. I appreciate what, uh, what Blair was talking about in terms of the mixed income housing, because what we're actually doing with this city is we're streamlining the production of housing for a majority of people that have never lived here in San Jose. That's why it's called Silicon Valley rather than San Jose to kind of use language to strip that history of San Jose so that people identify themselves as being from Silicon Valley because these are new people coming in with new money, okay? And so what you're doing is you're creating a two cultures. You're stratifying society. And this council is the means by which that process is facilitated in terms of the stratification. I know, some, I know a couple of students that, uh, that went to school in Stockholm, and he was telling me, Paul, we don't deal with this kind of problem. The way that San Jose is, is because Everybody of all different classes have to take the subways. So there's a sociological component to it, is that these people, the rich, the money, also go and they're sharing transportation with regular working class people. Okay, in San Jose, it's not like that. We're actually creating a system that stratifies. I mean, the housing issue, you're gonna have, you have 43,000 families that are on par to be evicted, and these landlords are literally salivating, salivating, yes, kick them out. Let's use the sheriff's department to do it. I feel bad for the sheriff's department because they are going to be forced to, uh, to enforce those evictions. Can you imagine that, going to these families' houses and kicking out some abuelitas? What do you think their family members are going to do when the cops show up to that house to boot them out? So, I mean, you guys really don't even have a clue of what it is that you're looking at or maybe you do and you're indifferent to it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, JT. The issue with people who have never been homeless is you guys just don't understand the issue. You can go ahead and waste a whole bunch of money on job uh, initiatives to people who frankly need addiction treatment we're spending $4 million a year on these motels. San Diego houses over 1,000 people per year in huge tents. So instead of actually investing in some infrastructure that can house people in the future, we're just giving, we're giving away our money to these motels. And whether someone's getting taken care of behind the scenes or this is pure incompetence, it actually doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is you're focusing on too many people and you're spending way too much money. It's not hard. Let's copy what San Diego is doing. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Scott Larton. 
Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Scott Largent. You know, I, I, I do get that this is a very complex issue. Uh, I, I The gentleman before me, uh, it kind of opened my eyes up a little bit right here. All, all the people that are on the streets that I'm interacting with need mental health services and drug treatment. So no matter what plans you guys are putting together right now um, to house them, give them more service, more trash pickup, more, you're kind of just feeding that meth dragon out there. Um, you got to get the pipe out of their mouth. You got to get them into drug treatment. Now, now we spend all this money on these hotels. Where's the vouchers for drug rehab? The cost of this, we could send people down to, you know, Sunny Acres Rehab down in L.A. I mean, we could send them to different counties, different states. My situation, what I needed to get off the streets of San Jose was to go to a drug rehab. I, I asked, I begged our county. I mean, you guys have heard this over and over again. The services are crap. And when somebody's at the door begging and begging and begging, we don't help them. Now, an example, down near Spring Street right there, uh, near the FAA crash zone right there. This thing is just turning into Skid Row over there right now. It's it's the Jungle 2.0. Why can't we go through there and just clean the area up? Now, Raul, that's your your area over there. That park is a is a is pretty bad, but we already have bathrooms. We already have plumbing ran there. Um, we have electrical. We have power. We have outdoor park benches. You know, why why don't we improve the area there to help those people? Um, maybe get some solar panels on their motorhomes. Maybe fix the gray water, um, you know, fix the black water, uh, get their, their rigs working properly, get them up to, uh, you know, kind of lift them up a little bit to get into a safe parking program, to get them so they can get to that next job interview. Um, I, I would challenge you guys to go out to Spring Street out there and just go out there and talk to people because there's a lot of normal people out there. They're not just what you think they all are. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Robert Geary. Yeah, Robert Aguirre. Um, I, I certainly appreciate what the housing department is doing, and I know that they've reached out to some uh, some of the advocates, but there's a lot of other advocates out there that are um, perhaps better connected and uh, can provide better help in some of the outreach that you guys are wanting to do. And we have uh, experience. We have, we have a lot more um, connection with the people than uh, the the service providers that you have lined up. And um, I, one of the concerns that I had is uh, the, the two, um, I don't even know what you're calling them anymore. They, they, uh, they're supposed to be like bridge housing that's going in down in uh, D2. Uh, I have asked if I could speak with the residents of the, uh, the, the existing uh, bridge housing community you know, to have a, a real heart-to-heart -heart talk with them and find out how well this program is working. You know, if you ask them and you've got the, uh, the people that are running it right there, they're going to be afraid to tell you exactly what's going on. And I think if we had uh, a way to have that communication with them and, and find out how well this program is actually working out and uh, having them be able to give their opinions without being uh, afraid of any kind of retribution uh getting kicked out for example and and we also need to have uh more of the people that are involved in making these decisions and not have it top down i think one time i asked you uh mayor Licardo, if you would like me to pick out your clothes for you and at first you didn't understand but once we started talking you realized that it's important for the people that uh decisions are being made be a part of that decision-making process and not just have people making decisions for them. And I, I think the one thing that continues to lack, and that's one of the reasons why uh, things like the trailer program didn't work out. And I would still like to see if th those trailers were given back or they were actually taken back. And that's something we need to figure out. Thank you. Okay, coming back now to the council. Uh, Comments, questions, or motion? Got a long night. You actually don't need a motion tonight because oh, it's right. just we here. don't need a motion tonight. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, we don't need that, but we'll take any questions you got. Councilmember Uh Thank you. 
So I just had a, um, some, first of all, I just wanted to say, um, I know it's been a long road um, between when you first started uh, to gather information for the, this consolidated plan, this five-year plan that is in coordination also with the county and today. And so, um, so congratulations, you're almost there. Um, my first question was, it sounds like uh, folks could still provide some of their feedback if they wanted to, right? And so I know that you have a hearing uh, on the 6th, but uh, even in 8.1, um, you still have an open period of time, right, where you can gather information. Correct. People can okay. attend the public hearing. They can make comments here that we heard today. People can submit their public comment in writing. Great. I, I just wanted to uh, reiterate that because I want people to know that it's not too late, that this is this is almost there, right, in, in terms of the finish line, uh, but there's still an opportunity to be heard, uh, especially if they represent a group of folks who are impacted um, uh, unhoused uh, community. And so I wanted just to make sure that they heard that. Um, the second thing I wanted to say was um, I really appreciate that you um, recognized who um, in terms of groups are being most impacted. Um, and I'm trying to find a page. I think you had, um, oh, 28% of uh, Black African American households spend more than half. And so this is for the city of San Jose. Um, I, I think that we have a very, uh, I, can't remember what the total percentage of uh, African Americans are in our city, but I know it's relatively uh, small, uh, but that they share the 28%, almost a third uh, of um, households that have more than half of their income on housing costs is, is alarming, as well as um, for, for the Latino households, which we um, suspected. And like you said, you hear, uh, on a weekly basis, the, the, the issues that happen with uh, overcrowding. Um, and so, and then you also uh, mentioned uh, Pacific Island residents in American Indian and Alaskan Natives reported more housing problems than average. How did those, how did those figures help you um, develop some of these strategies? I wanted, I wanted to just have that um, connection between the data that you're um, presenting and that you gather and and strategies that you're using. So whether you're focused more in some Latino communities or some of those grants are going to be, uh, uh, that's gonna be taken into consideration in terms of, of areas or um, of concentration. So if you can just uh, show me those dots. Sure, so actually that's a really good question. So, uh, Clearly, one of the things we've been doing is uh, we've been working with the COVID-19 rental assistance program and the funding that we have been providing there. We have been very clear with the providers that are, we would like to prioritize where the funding goes. So we did not, when they initially came to us, they had wanted to do a first come first serve approach, but we felt that that did not address these underlying issues and needs. And so uh, one of the first things we asked uh, when we met with them was to re-look at how they were going to screen and select people that would be receiving services. Um, as I said, many of the contracts that we're doing right now are contracts that we are carrying forward, but it is our anticipation that as we begin to RFP these new funds, that we would create RFPs that would ask the recipients specifically, how do they address these particular populations and groups that are not uh, able to access services at the same levels at, uh, as other people and ask for their information regarding how effective they are in impacted communities. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, I appreciate that and I appreciate hearing that uh, that this is gonna, I wouldn't expect anything different from you that, that this is would be strategically aligned with, with those uh, upcoming RFPs that you're going to release. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear that. Um, the last question that I had, well, you know, I wanted to also just uh, recognize that you added that third area 
in terms of strengthening and stabilizing communities' conditions. And I think that's going to be absolutely crucial. Um, I've got to say that I know that you um, have your work cut out for you, um, even pre pandemic and so to add this piece which makes a lot of sense um is is um you know it will be a challenge is there going to be additional staff that's going to uh, provide support for this area how are you all going to handle um this fourth item on your uh, consolidated plan so one of the things that we've done and again this is um part of the COVID-19 work, but it aligns with this new funding category is the funding that we are providing in collaboration with the Office of Economic Development, which are these small business loans that we're funding. And in that case, j just in terms of your previous question, we are doing specific targeted outreach to underrepresented communities to ensure that they know in multiple languages that this opportunity exists so that again, the numbers that we receive uh, um, are uh, aligned with the amount of issues that we're seeing in those communities. So we're doing it by targeted outreach. So we're trying to partner with new groups. So whether it's the Office of Economic Development uh, or we're doing more out, try to find a homeless provider who really can address the needs of homeless people. We did hear some speakers say no job training is not necessary, but we know that it really is. And uh, what we're, you know, what we're challenged with is finding somebody, uh, like we had to find a specific outreach people that really wanted to do the kind of work on homelessness with path, path, um, we need to find the same types of people that are going to do the types of work that we want to be focused on. So we have to find new partnerships in order to create and implement these new strategy, that particular strategy. Wonderful. Um, and I think I gave you a, uh, a referral for Community Seva. They're an absolutely small grassroots driven um, uh, nonprofit, but, and they provide services citywide. So um, I hope that they can also be somehow included. They do this on their own. Um, uh, you know, uh, money. Uh, and so uh, I think that expanding their capacity would be great. But, you know, it completely, um, they have to go through whatever process is already established. So um, I'm glad to hear that, although I am, um, I'm glad to, to hear that you have some very strategic ways of aligning <laughs> your, your, what you found in terms of needs uh, to to some of these goals and your strategies. Um, and so then I'm, I guess I'm assuming that you won't have additional staff. Um, we are, we did, um, I think we, we're gonna add at least one additional staff person to help with the $100 million <laughs> additional money we're receiving. Uh, on the grand side, we're also adding a fiscal person that can help uh, you know, coordinate that. And we're also adding another homeless staff person to help on the development of the homeless programs. And I don't know, did I miss anyone, Reagan? I'm, I'm just it. happy, I'm happy to hear that you'll have additional support is ultimately what I was looking for. Um, uh, because I know that development um, has its own needs. Uh, and then, of course, this uh, consolidated plan is a very human services um, directed. And so I, I know it tears you into two, two completely different directions, if you will. Um, wonderful. The last thing I wanted to ask you was, I know that, that we've had some issues with RVs that have been parked in the streets. And um, unfortunately, um, uh, the owners of some of those RVs are not just using it to have an over a place to stay overnight and put a roof over their heads, but you know they've just created some chaos for some of the residents. And I know many of them have been um, towed away, or what you know, and people have lost their their opportunity opportunity to have a, a roof over their heads um, because of that. Has there been any strategy that that or from the feedback that you heard in the community? Um, that would help shape any any kind of uh, support for folks who um, own the RVs and are you know continuing to use that as uh, as their shelter. I think one of the common things that we 
uh, are hearing is that oftentimes people living in their RV don't view themselves as homeless. They purchase their RV. This is their place of uh, residence. One of the things that the ESG CARES is going to allow us to do is to provide some funding specifically for RV support services. It's uh, lumped in with that um, trash service under the hygiene and infection control, but we'll be able to provide some trash removal and some mobile sanitation services specifically for RVs with this um, ESG CARES money. Awesome. And I'm glad you I mentioned the, uh, the, the CARES money, uh, the ESG CARES money in that SOAR program, because I know our Thompson Creek uh, neighborhood um, has uh, their community of unhoused, their unhoused community, um, and that has provided a lot of support uh, for, the, for those particular folks. Um, and so that cohabitating with one another is easier um, uh, because everybody is at home, right? Anyways, uh, thank you so much for all your work. And then uh, hopefully you could send out a tweet or post on your Facebook how uh, folks can um, give their final uh, word in um, before this all gets uh, solidified. Um, that would be wonderful. So thank you. Thank oh, you. and then there's no motion, correct? Uh, no, we won't have a motion until next week. OK. Uh, Councilor Jimenez. Yeah, thank you, Mary. Just had a question sort of along the same lines as something that uh, Council Member Adenas touched on. Uh, and Jackie mentioned this to you. Uh, and really, I asked this question just in the spirit of, uh, it, it seems to me this this being uh, opening up the hearing and gathering input from us and, and from community members. But so, so the consolidated plan for spending priorities, I think the last one, number four, is what uh, Council Member Adenas mentioned, strengthening, stabilizing communities. That seems to me to be one of the categories, go to page nine, that maybe seems a little bit more, um, not as sort of strictly tied to housing, if, if that's a good way to put it, right? It seems a little looser with regards to how you could spend that money. It it's seems. broader, yes. Right, and so, and so um, what I'm curious about, are you able to use that to hire staff? I know there's restrictions on all different types of money, and I'm curious as to what you're what you're able to do. Yeah. We can't hire staff. Uh, there's a, a a limitation to administration on how much we can hire to implement a program, so or oversee or manage the grants. Right. Um, and I, and I, I, I think the challenge with staff is how HUD views that is uh, we can't supplant city funding. Um, if something mm -hmm. should be funded by the city, the federal programs shouldn't pick it up. So I guess it's maybe a further clarification of what you're thinking about. Um, yeah, and I'll, and, I, and I'll explain yeah. explain and share. I think may, it may be, provide some clarity. And so, um, you know, just looking at, uh, you know, some of the categories in their child care services, obviously all worth doing, right? Child care facilities development. And then you had talked about working with the Office of Economic Development. What came to mind for me is in reading the report and, and, and noticing, I think the number was about 45% of the residents in San Jose are rent burdened, right? Uh, those are folks that are barely making it and they, they um, contribute to a large percentage of their income to just paying the rent, right? Uh, and obviously that leaves little, little money for other things like food and daycare and things of that nature. And so um, with that in mind, obviously, uh, it seems to me that the the wages that people earn um, are super important, right? So that because they're so rent burdened, every penny that they earn is even that much more important, right? Uh, and so looking at that and then reading the story recently as it relates to the Office of Equality Assurance and not potentially not having enough staff to enforce some of the wage theft going on in the city, I was just thinking that if there was some nexus there, some connection that could be made between this category and really making certain that, or, or the possibility of you all using some of this funding to plug some of those holes to make sure people are earning enough money and, and earning the money they've earned, actually getting the money they've earned in order to pay that rent, right? And that's what I was thinking about. I'm not sure what your thoughts are on that or if there is a way to, to work something like that in. Um, I know there's no motion, but just consider this my input. I, I just, I, I think there's other opportunities within other departments that can 
um, I think help ease some of the burden that you so explicitly mentioned in these reports. Um, and uh, I think it just speaks to the intersectionality, as we often say, of many of these issues, right? And, and so, it, it, you know, if you all can get creative and if there's anything you can do as it relates to those things, I think it'd, it'd be worth exploring. I just thought I'd mention that. Sure, we'll definitely look into it since it's part of the public comment. We, we actually have to respond to every public comment idea. Uh, in our public comments. So we'll definitely look into it. And I would absolutely agree with you. I've been saying over the past few years that economic development is actually the other side of this problem. If people earned enough money, we wouldn't need to support their affordable housing needs, right? Because they would have a high enough wage to support their cost of living if there was a connection between wages and cost of living. And so hence why we really think that partnership with the Office of Economic Development and looking at employment opportunities and how to improve people's access to better being wage, wages is a very important strategy. Yeah, and I think what I mentioned even takes it further, right? It's that certainly getting people good wages, good jobs, getting them into those, those, uh, those lanes, so to speak, but once they have that, how do we make certain they're actually getting paid what they're supposed to be getting paid, right? And I think that uh, is sort of the natural extension of that. Uh, um, so anyway, I, I, I thought I would mention that. And just for clarification, so as you said, you have to answer, you have to reply to every public comment. The comments we make during the course of this meeting, are those considered public comments? They are. Okay. All right. Cool. All right. Thank you. Councilman uh, Resparza. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I had um, a few questions. Uh, so one is, um, so we're spending two million, correct, on homeless prevention out of these funds, a rapid rehab for rapid rehousing. So two million for rapid rehousing includes an element of rental assistance. So there is a uh, home funding that is going to rental assistance. It's the two point, it's close to 2.7. Okay. And then, um, so we've had some conversations, but I think in the interest of public discussion, um, can you explain why we're not, I mean, I think the Law Foundation found out that uh, 43,000 families are at risk of eviction. And we just had a description of um, in your report about folks that are paying over half of their income on rent. Um, can you talk to the point about why we're not spending more money on homeless prevention with these funds? Sure, so the funding, homeless prevention is an eligible activity under the $32 million of ESG funding. And as Reagan mentioned in her opening comments, we've been very fortunate to be receiving HUD technical assistance where we're actually meeting with the technical assistance providers on a weekly basis with the county. And one of the things that they let us know regarding ESG was HUD's viewpoint that this was an opportunity for cities to really address the issue of homelessness that uh, many cities are facing and that HUD wanted to see these funds really going to homeless people and not going to people who are currently housed. And the strategy that we're employing is actually ensuring that actually the people we're sheltering in both our homeless shelters, the temporary COVID-19 shelters, which include the motels and the uh, larger shelter that we're continuing to provide, we're focusing some of this money on ensuring that those people don't end up back on the streets. And so um, it's really consistent with our overall plan in addressing homelessness for people who are actually unhoused now. Thank you, because I think, um, and I don't know if Lee is still on the call, but um, yes, I see, I see Lee's face. Um, but when um, uh, the government relations team reports back to us, you know, one of the things we really need to look at is David Chu has a bill, but what are the other efforts, all of the efforts going on? Because um, it's really frightening to think about what is going to happen and how our community is going to physically be reshaped uh, when people are evicted and don't have anywhere to go. Yes, yeah, so we're planning on coming August 25th 
with a full report out on where we are with the eviction moratorium. We are looking at the report that was published. We'll give you an update on all the bills, what's happening with the state, the federal government, their eviction moratorium just was lifted this past week. They did not uh, um, issue a new one uh, that only you know, applied to very specific uh, mm -hmm. narrow HUD-based programs, uh, but we will be coming back again on August 25th with a full update. Yeah, thank you. I, um, you know, the county um, just lost a vote two to three on a potential tax to, um, to pay for this tsunami that we all know has, that has been coming. And because these are really big numbers that, you know, two million is not going to it's just not going to address. Um, and so we need to, and by we, I mean, everybody in government needs to, and, and foundations and our other partners and our for-profit partners through their um, philanthropy efforts. But really at the end of the day, I think it's a government responsibility to step up because these numbers are so huge. Um, so uh, I had uh, some questions. So I was really, really happy to see that you have new outreach positions included in the proposal and you had uh, mentioned it before, um, was it June 30th? I can't remember, it's a little bit of a blur. Uh, but when you talked about mental health, including mental health and the outreach teams. Um, so I see outreach specialists, case managers, mental health counselors, and drug and alcohol counselors, which is huge. Um, I think, um, frankly, a substance abuse epidemic is a big barrier for people getting help. Um, I have, uh, and I and the mayor and other folks have met with folks, hi, <laughs> um, have met um, with uh, different county folks um, I know I've been doing it since I started on the council. The mayor has called meetings together. And um, really, we need to address systems. Um, I know the county had been working on some systems mapping pre-COVID um, and had added beds. So for example, um, <laughs> there was drug detox. Uh, so there were detox beds, but then what? So how did people go from a detox bed to the next step to eventually getting um, into a program, right? Because it's not just great, you get to come in off the street and boom, you're gonna get in a program and be housed. And have, making sure that system is connected and then the number of beds and openings and different from one program to the next is connected is critical to the success of this outreach. Um, so that people are ready and safe um, to, to, to take those next steps that I think we all are rooting for them to take. Um, and so, um, so what I wanted to ask was how we are coordinating with the county's behavioral health in particular so that this work slots into those systems because my biggest fear what's been happening is first off law enforcement ends up dealing with a lot of this stuff which you know may or may not be appropriate um and um and, and a lot of um issues aren't getting dealt with on the ground people aren't getting help in in real time they might after 20 calls um but you know they might eventually get help but how are we working with these great positions and enhanced outreach into that county behavioral health system. So that's a place where we now have a real opportunity uh, with the new community plan to end homelessness that we're going to be bringing forward for your consideration on August 25th. There's a whole new section. You know, once we got kind of the basics done in our coordination, we're really moving on to the next step which is these systems that you're talking about that are frankly have been outside of both the city of ha the city's housing department and the county's housing uh, supportive housing office those systems lie they're still in the county but they are not controlled by um, 
neither myself nor Key. Uh, the good news is that Key now has been has been promoted in the county is going to be overseeing this entire system of care. And given that new role that he has, we now have a really good chance of actually coordinating those systems in a way that aligns with homelessness and ensures that we can have access to services. So we don't really have those access, the access that we need now. And there are certainly limitations, but we also know that most people don't accept, yeah, I'm going to take drug treatment immediately, or I'm going to take mental health immediately because it's often a process before you can get somebody to trust you to actually take that next step. But it is absolutely one of our focuses that we have to get those systems better aligned and we have to completely understand the availability of the system to begin to absorb the number of people that we know absolutely need the help. And my guess is right now that those systems are just not, um, they're not available to the extent that we need them. Yeah, or in a timely way. Um, because I'll, I'll tell you, like an EPS, when somebody's in there for an hour and then they go back out into the street, um, you know, behavioral health may not know that that person really went to EPS with enough time to really do an adequate assessment so that they can get into a program. And so, um, that's great news about key, and I would just um, suggest, um, I think um, this is going to come between the county re-entry committee um, at some point to do a presentation. I think that's really important because there are other stakeholders in the county um, beyond just behavioral health that need to have an understanding of this system and the fact that the city is um, stepping up in a really huge way with this investment. And so that includes probation, public defender, the DA's office, the judges, you know, all the, the, the players um, to really uh, buy into what we're trying to do or it's not gonna be successful. So, um, and I, um, again, I offer my assistance in that because um, it needs to be successful. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any final questions before? Uh, I assume we don't take action. Is that right? This simply goes on next week. Okay. Uh, so thank you, Jackie. And thank you, Reagan. And thank you, uh, Riley, Ella, uh, and Georgia for your guest appearances. Um, I think we'll then move on to public comment. Um, or public forum, I should say. Um, before we do so, did, did I don't we have one more item just to, uh, which was, and maybe I missed it, but it was just making sure that we had an item on changing the public participation process. I think we voted on that. Did you? And I missed it. Okay. Yeah, we've already done that item. Okay, great. Here we are, Jackie. If you blink, you'll miss it. Yes. Uh, okay, uh, and I, I do want to make a brief announcement. I know this was not, I, I was told this was not made earlier, so I just want to uh, make this announcement publicly, uh, obviously very belatedly. Uh, Nora Freeman has been appointed uh, interim city attorney. I think it's well uh, known that uh, as we commemorated, honored uh, Rick earlier today, Rick will be retiring. Uh, we will be having a selection process with council uh, in the interim, uh, Nora Freeman will be serving as city attorney for the city of San Jose. Okay, uh, we're going to go on to open forum. Uh, I have four members of the committee who'd like to speak. Scott Largent. Great. Uh, thank you, everyone. Scott Largent. Uh, this is a very interesting meeting uh, to listen to. Uh, seems like we got a lot of really good ideas in front of us. Uh, we got $100 million, I guess, coming into the pool right here. And um, hopefully we uh, we do this right. Uh, Maya, I appreciate, I'm so apologize for calling by first name. I don't want to butcher your last name. Um, I, I, what, what you said is about that we have to get this right, that we can't mess this up. And, and I, I, I would fully, fully agree with you. Um, a lot of my work, my volunteer work, was just to make sure people didn't go through what I went through uh, almost five years ago. I threw in the towel, 
and, and I just, I needed help. And I begged and I pleaded. It, it, it just never happened. Um, it was a bad interaction with law enforcement. Uh, they didn't know really what to do. Uh, mental health, behavioral health, drug treatment. It was just all, it was all downhill. Um, we have the opportunity r right now to start, and I know this sounds like, it almost sounds like a vulgar word to say vetting. But why are we not pulling the people out that we can put into safe parking programs, into some type of sanctioned encampments? Why are we not going through that segment of our community and figuring that out? Um, myself, I am I am homeless after COVID hit. Um, I have a storage unit. I, I live in a van, and I live in the county parking lot because it's safe, it's well lit, and I can't be around the meth addicts. I can't live near uh, any of these type of encampments, even though I interact with people during the day and I advocate for them. I'm meeting a lot of people that are just like me, that, that, that want to be parents, that were previous business owners, that fell on hard times. Um, how do we lift these people back up? I'm figuring a way out of my situation. I want to help get these people back on track. Um, we all fall off every once in a while, and, and, and I really think we need to just do more. Please do more. Thank you. Thank you, Paul Soto. Yeah, good evening, Council. Um, I wanted to talk about what Councilwoman Esparza spoke about at the very beginning of this meeting. I heard everything. I've been here for the entire meeting. And what she talked about, and first of all, I would like to extend to you my deepest sympathies and my understanding that of the loss that you incurred as a result of that savage human being that went to that park with the intention of killing Mexicans. That's what was on his mind. He wanted to kill Mexicans, period. Okay, I went with uh, Rebecca Armendariz, who is a, a candidate for city council for uh, the city of Gilroy. And we both went to Kayla's uh, one year remembrance and it was held at five wounds. And I sat there and I watched his family suffer. And I had just dawned on me that I was sitting across from the McDonald's where this savage police officer literally drags a Mexican across the floor like she was like he was the slave master and she was the slave and then kick her in the stomach. Where is the where is the that officer didn't know whether or not she was pregnant and he proceeded to kick her in the stomach and it had just dawned on me. It's like, what is happening? What is going on in my city? What is going on in my county? Where this kind of savage, bestial, sadistic kind of behavior can go on and we don't talk about it. We do not talk about it. We're afraid of it. I'm not afraid of it. I've dealt with racism all my life. I come from generations that have dealt with racism and I'm here and I'm not gonna tolerate it anymore. I am not going to tolerate a human being walking around and thinking that we're target practice or we're fodder for his white supremacist ideas, that my life doesn't mean nothing. It's not gonna happen. Again, I extend my condolences to you, uh, Councilwoman Esparza. I'm with you. Thank you. Robert E. Geary. Yeah, Robert E. Geary. Uh, listen, I, I keep bringing up the idea that we need to have like a, uh, a committee or a, a council or some, some sort of group of people that are unhoused, previously unhoused, formerly unhoused, however you want to word it, that can uh, review some of the policies that the uh, city is planning on uh, putting in place. So we have that perspective and that perspective is consistent and that uh, it represents a much wider uh, audience of people that are living in under these conditions. And uh, I haven't seen anything going forward on that. And I'm, I'm really disappointed about that because I know that I'm not the only advocate out there that's really pushing uh, to make things better for the unhoused. But uh, it just seems like this keeps happening over and over again. And yet we're, we're not uh, doing anything to try to uh, bring this kind of representation to council so that the council has a better idea of what's going on uh, out on the streets. And I, I know that there's, there's talk about um, you know, um, substance abuse and, and other types of things that, that go on out there. Well, those things go on in the house community as well. And, and I'm not saying that we should ignore those things, but I, I think there's a greater number of people that aren't uh, mentally ill, that aren't uh, addicted to anything, 
that need uh, just as much attention. And, and I think those are the people that are much closer to being able to become uh, productive uh, citizens in this society and uh, for uh, due to unforeseen situations that have brought them to this condition, they find it very difficult to get out of. And uh, when we keep deciding for them what is good for them and not involving them in those decisions on an ongoing basis, then we're, we're going to miss the mark. And uh, I, I, I don't necessarily have to be the person that's on that committee. I would love to be that person or one of those persons. But I, I think that the idea of not doing anything is, is going to cause us to not be as productive as we would like to be with whatever projects we move forward. Thank you. Thank you, JT. I'd like to echo Robert's sentiments. I think it's silly and foolish that you all are making decisions for homeless people without including them. And to the person who had replied to my comment about people not needing jobs, I'm gonna give you some insight into the homeless population. The vast majority of people that you see on the streets are the folks that choose not to follow the rules or they can't. So we're not saying they're bad people, but they can't stop drinking, they can't stop doing drugs. I get that some of you live in this fairy tale world where we can give them some training and kumbaya, they're done. But the reality is you could give them every resource. They might use it up until uh, you know, they get through some kind of program and then go right back. So if you think that you're going to give job, job training to people living on the street and that's going to bring them off the street, you're living in Disneyland. It, it's like we're acting like people don't move, like people don't seek shelter. You guys need to understand the people on the street are very different from the people you see in the shelters. The people who can't or refuse to follow the rules, you can't help them the same way. The only way that you're going to make things better is with transitional housing. And I mean, we have smart people calling in and, and telling you guys, listen to the community, involve the homeless in the solution. The definition of, of, of insanity is doing the same thing twice and expecting different results. We've had the same issues forever. We're going about it in the same way. Listen to Robert, listen to Paul, include the homeless. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kave? Hi, thank you, Mayor, for this opportunity. Um, I'm a District 9 resident, and I am, um, I believe, um, all the council members were copied on my email uh, a couple of day, nights ago that um, for the past three months, we were experiencing a lot of car side show in our neighborhood. We, um, unfortunately, um, the level of responsiveness from the police department was not enough. It all got started in May 29. Um, that was the first event. Um, none of the police officers or law enforcement showed up on that night after we made the call. On July 8, when we reached out to the police department, they showed up, maybe four or five officers, but they showed up at the time that the sideshow was done. So we had the opportunity to talk to some of them and asking them what the issues are. First, obviously, they were um, uh, saying that there's a lack of resources at the police department. And uh, we would, we also try to offer them the photos of, and the incident and also the plate numbers of the vehicles. They indicated that they are unable to make the arrest. So the last incident happened on August 1st, which um, I decided to start a petition on that because it's, it's absolutely unacceptable for the police department to show up, not taking any actions, not even trying to disperse the crowd, just sitting in a car. And after the sideshow is ended, when you talk to them, they are afraid of getting engaged in that. And they are telling me that the city policy is not to chase these violators. The city policy um, is not to just get engaged because we don't know what's going on in that crowd, how many guns are in that crowd. And at the end of the day, you, you, the city council approved an ordinance last year to um, make the spectators of these scenes a crime and a fine of up to $1,000. Just can someone tell me how many spectators were fined in the night of August 1st here? None. 
because the police department doesn't get engaged. So I, I'm not going to stop this. And um, I'm, I'm really disappointed at the way that the city is handling these issues and especially the sideshows. We are desperately need your help. And in a petition that we created in the next door, there are a bunch of options, adding CCTV cameras, getting help from the town of Los Gatos, uh, uh police department, because we're right at the border. We are at the uh, Los Gatos, Almaden Road and Lee Avenue. Just we're right at the border with Lo town of Los Gatos. So we're pretty much like fed up with this. I think we need your help and we need your support. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Beekman? Oh, I'm sorry. Mayor, uh, can I just jump in for a minute? Please, yeah. Uh, Kave, I know this is uh, Pam Foley, council member for District 9. I know that you have been in contact with our office, and I believe that we have an appointment next week to meet and discuss uh, solutions and way that we might be able to address this. So thank you for coming and bringing this to our attention. But we we haven't uh, forgotten about you. We'll meet you next week and, and discuss this further. OK, uh, Mr. Beekman. Hi, thank you. Um, I feel the practices of, uh, of, a, I, of a local community democracy that tries to work towards and listen to the voice of each individual compared with local democracies that try to develop its ideas more as a body of voices like a republic uh, can be an important way to understand and address the ideas of demilitarization, defunding, reform, and restructuring at this time of both a police department and a city government. Uh, it may be to consider our human relations and our use of language that is what may be a revolution at this time. I hope my previous words and examples today can be of help to teach and work towards fewer arrests and less harassment of people at protests and how to teach better day-to-day -day community relations as well. In considering the past few months of protests, please use your current comfort levels to continue to look for the good ideas and community possibilities seen from that time and how this can connect to the ideas of equity and positive sustainability unique to San Jose. I really believe it's the ideas of individual democracy that we need to talk about and, and how to you know, create a new push past our ideas of, of democracy as a republic. I think that's key for ourselves to consider what we can do for ourselves as individual local communities and, and as democracy. Thank you. Um, also, I wanted to uh, add with as much time, I got 22 seconds. Ash Cara is working on really incredible stuff at the state level about how uh, tenants can have uh, uh, the next year and a half to pay off their, their, uh, their, their, their rent and how owners, uh, there's also stuff how uh, owners can, and can pay off their mortgages. So I, I don't like the mayor's real dour talk if that's what's been happening. Make it positive, work with Ashkara and, and let's talk positive in San Jose. Thank you. Thank you, uh, the meeting's adjourned.